a bitch till you think you can elude us forever, Carlos? Huh? Wait! You got the wrong guy. My name's Simon. Look, look, j j just let me go. There's, there's no need to kill me. I haven't seen your face. No, 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 I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I... The game's over. Your career as an international terrorist has been well documented. No. Oh, yeah. No, no, oh, yeah. No, no, no. I, I sell cars. That's all. Come on. I'm not a terrorist. I'm actually a complete coward. If I ever saw a gun, I'd all. Oh, God, oh, please don't go. Don't, don't, don't kill me. Yes, yes. A throwback movie to the good old fun days. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Tom Arnold, Bill Paxton yucking it up in True Lies about a fun covert intelligence operation, not at all scary, where the terrorists are really just used car salesmen. Oh, the good old days. Oh, maybe they weren't so good. Here's what was really going on. Well, he cut his teeth in Vietnam, you know, doing this very, very spooky operation called uh, Wandering Soul. He developed these recordings known as Ghost Tape Number 10. And mm -hmm. basically what they would do is they would play these uh, sort of eerie sounds and, and wailings. The idea of this was to sort of suggest and to play off uh, what they imagined as being the Vietnamese belief in uh, wandering ghosts and, and spirits. It's very uh, Sam Harris type of sneering thing where it's like, oh, we can manipulate these savages' beliefs. Uh, Even to bring know. it up to the 80s to the to Michael Quino's very odd performances on Oprah and the Geraldo show when he went on to, you know, basically defend the temple of set and satanic practices and stuff during the height of the so-called satanic panic. You could almost see a parallel between Operation Wandering Soul and what he was doing there because he was going on TV in such a provocative way where it's like he knew he was going to basically trigger all of the kind of conservative Christian types that were being terrified by what Oprah and Geraldo and all these other people were saying about how there's these evil cults. But then he was also sitting there and going like, that is actually not true. I am, you know, I might have devil eyebrows and have this like, you know, like very witchy wife and stuff and seem very sinister. <laughs> but, you know, actually there's nothing to see here. It almost like it, it in, in the sense of the real goal of the recording of Wandering Soul was to get the, the Viet Cong soldiers to, to get angry and reveal their position and expose themselves and it was it was all about eliciting a psychological reaction that was actually not exactly what the kind of ostensible goal of of the operate of the psyop so i got this interview coming up with the guys from subliminal jihad which is a fantastic podcast that i discovered and i want you to check out as well we cover so many topics in this interview but one of the focus points is this guy michael aquino who is a satanist pedophile probably murderer of children almost for sure and a guy who was legitimately embraced by our military and intelligence organizations. I mean, he was totally embedded. He was highly, highly regarded for his knowledge and insights for mind control and mind games. Here's an additional clip. And I think that, you know, for instance, you mentioned the twerking on the devil. You know, this is a huge uh, flashpoint in our culture, a huge controversy over uh, Lil Nas X's video. A common point that people made vis-a-vis -vis the video was that, well, you know, look at the ending. You know, Lil Nas X, actually, he's using his sexuality to seduce the devil. But in the end, he kills the devil and then he puts the devil's horns on himself. So really, he's killing Satan. So isn't that good? And it's like, well, you know, if you think about what these people like Michael Aquino, for instance, what they really believe, like that actually matches up perfectly with their mm -hmm. ideas about their how their relationship with these entities work. You know, they, of course, no one's ever going to sign on to like the Christian idea of a deal with the devil like that people will warn you about. No one would take that deal, probably. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's because they think that they have a loophole. They always have a way out, you know, and oftentimes it's because they can ascend themselves. They can become, you know, the dark prince or, you know, the god unto themselves. That's exactly what Setianism teaches, like, mm -hmm. uh, which is... Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, a vulgar, more secularized version of that in the Church of Satan and an even further more uh, secularized version of that in the, the Satanic Temple, where you have the idea that there, you know, you can yourself. It's all about the, the aggrandizement of the self, you know, the ascension of the self, the mm -hmm. godhood of, of the Becoming the a god. Yeah, yes. exactly. They think that they're, they're not going to be accountable because they will, you know, find a loophole that they will become, they will become set. You know, as I've said before, I'm not into staring into the abyss, and I don't want to do it in this case. 
But I do feel like we do need to reach, as I keep saying in this interview, terra firma. We need to have some kind of ground that we stand on to at least look out and assess the playing field. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Karras, and today we welcome two very interesting guys, creators of a remarkable podcast called Subliminal Jihad. We have Dmitry Poshlost and Khalid Ben Yaqib here to join me. Now, I had to struggle through those names. Guys, did I get was that okay? Yeah, that's mm-hmm. adequate. You did adequate. It, yep. Yeah, yeah, you did it well. All right. Because, uh-huh. because, like I said, from here on out, it's it's Dimitri and Khalid the whole way. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> works for me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I kind of stumbled across your really truly remarkable kind of off the radar, I think, for a lot of people, but let's hope not. Show from the Opperman report. And I was kind of blown away and I came over to your excellent sound. It's on SoundCloud and it's also on Apple Podcasts. We're an Apple Podcast. Yeah. Yeah, And uh, Patreon as well. Okay. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. So I did. I'm on Patreon to support these guys. They're doing some really, really great work. So I started digging into the shows and, you know, I'm thinking of this as kind of a swapcast kind of thing and that I just want to kind of introduce this podcast to people and then we'll just kind of chat about the world kind of thing because the shows that these guys do two sometimes three hours with dense dense information I was telling Demetri you know (laughs) it's like I love listening to them but I'm like they're pausing and making audio notes the whole way through with all the and they're not doing name dropping kind of thing they're doing like deep name connection this idea and that idea and so many of the things that we talk about on this show so great to have you guys here welcome to skeptico can you start by telling us a little bit about your background and then the origins of this podcast yeah sure it's great to be here i'm very excited and yeah i don't know call it i guess we we've known each other for quite some time and yeah, we're old RIL friends, you know, which isn't the case with all podcasts. But yeah, we are authentic RIL friends. And we, yeah, we know each other for a while. And we've both had, we've talked about doing this for a long time, because I think as we mentioned on the show, you know, we're both, we both did like a lot of writing, like creative writing, you know, uh, collaboratively together, like at, mm-hmm. at various times. And, you know, we would have long uh, conversations, brainstorming ideas for things, projects like that. And we always felt that we would be good at the the podcast. I mean, I feel like something that people often point out about our show is that I have like a very annoying voice and Dimitri has like a very a sonorous, like uh, mellifluous sort of beautiful one, <laughs> which wasn't something that I, I thought of as being a dynamic of the podcast. But I just thought that since we talk like at such length, like all the time, you know, it would just be a natural fit. And we always had an interest in, you know, in, in the occult, Dimitri, particularly in conspiracies and, and that type of thing. And I've always been interested in religion, spirituality, and in particular, you know, esoteric forms of that. So I felt like we had kind of an intersection of interests. And when we were kind of talking about what the podcast theme would be, that was naturally what we gravitated to. So yeah, that's kind of the the short genesis of it. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Dimitri. Uh, well, well, Khaled, yeah. Khaled one, one second there, because I, I, I totally get that. And that's super interesting. What about, you know, personally, you guys don't reveal a lot. You guys are really kind of off the radar a little bit. I mean, personally, about, you know, how old are you? What is your background? What did you do before this? What do you do now? I mean, what are you without revealing? Yeah, Yeah. we're millennials. I'm an academic. Yeah, I'm in academia. And yeah, Yeah. I work on like Islamic intellectual history is is what my my research is. And yeah. 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 As for me, I live in Los Angeles. That's another thing about us. We're on both coasts. So yes, um, right. Mm-hmm. we used to live in the same place, but not for many years, which is kind of why the, the, the Skype and Zoom brainstorming sessions started to begin with. But I've been in LA for like about a decade and I've worked kind of in and around the film business. And like Colin said, I've done a uh, 
a, a decent amount of uh, or a decent bit of screenwriting kind of in the periphery of Hollywood and a lot of the scripts that I had worked on maybe over the last five or six years, a lot of them had a very heavy historical bent or, you know, they were either biopics or historical things. So I ended up doing tons of research into certain topics that led me down these rabbit holes where I just kept digging further and further and further. And then kind of that that's actually where I think kind of my interest in quote unquote conspiracy culture really took off. And then yeah, I know I've worked as a video editor and a bunch of other things around, you know, LA and you know, like the entertainment business. Nothing that you would like notice if I like shouted it out right now. But, you know, just a lot of things here and there. So, yeah, that's like we do have kind of like an art background to some extent, yeah. which I think is like an interesting angle to take. You know, we talk a lot about Hollywood and cinema and, you know, that kind of are the art form yes. both in mm -hmm. kind of more yeah. <laughs> contemporary sense because also like part of the reason I think besides the pandemic that finally really pushed us into starting the podcast was yes. this feeling that Hollywood is less and less amenable certainly to the types of projects I had been working on for five years and you know in some cases for example they were critical uh they had themes in it that were critical of the United States military and I found <laughs> out in a very subtle way going to dozens and dozens of meetings and you know with the producers executives and stuff and a couple of times people you know kind of told me under their breath look man you know anything that has the military that has anything negative about the military in it is not going to get funding from the military you know you, you know they give out free stuff if you write something about them and if they and but then they get script approval on it and so if you write something that they don't approve of then the budget of your project just skyrocketed and therefore most producers are loath to even kind of get involved and that's why you basically don't see any anti-war or empire critical content coming out of Hollywood, I think, probably since like the Iraq war days was the last little tiny bird. Instead, it's all about how brave the CIA is and stuff. So that, that that's kind of maybe more my like personal motivation of being very frustrated in Hollywood and realizing that there is so much, so many layers of subtle kind of massaging and certain doors allowed to be, you know, certain doors open, other ones closed. It's kind of this very, you know, you could almost say subliminal system of of gatekeeping and, and like a, in a kind of way that, you know, and I think both of us, you know, having done creative writing, like understand that, you know, there's ideological content. Let in, me interject in, something here and, and mm -hmm. either one of you guys can sure. address it, but directly to you, Dimitri, because I was just thinking about this the other day. One of the things I appreciate about you guys, you guys say you're millennials, I'm a little bit older than that, but I appreciate that you're not afraid to go back and kind of dig through some recent history. So, you know, Michael Aquino is one of the first shows that kind of caught my attention, the kind of high satanic priest and chaplain in the United States Army, a proven pedophile and proven Satanist and all this, but he's circa 1960, you know, and, and before, and, and, as you guys trace, and you guys do an awesome job of tracing that whole history. But my point is that to a certain extent, what your show does by, by its willingness to go back, you know, even like you did the thing on Jeffrey Epstein, it's like, okay, start cranking it back. And now, boom, the connections start leading us further and further back. Don't you get kind of a more of a business as usual sense about that, Dimitri? You know, when you talk about Hollywood in the last 10 years and what's going on, fuck, man, that's business as freaking, you know, normal. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think the more that I've, I've had to revise even my own history and even in our, some, some of our most recent episodes, I've discovered new things that throw even, yeah, the further back history of Hollywood in quite a different light that, you know, I realized that, yeah, no, that's been a gradual process of discoveries that Hollywood's always been, it's always been Hollywood Babylon. You know what I mean? From like the very beginning, it's always been a dirty business. And I think it's just sort of like, it's, it, there are new things manifesting. I think the really the only thing that's kind of really new in the last 10 years in particular is the um hybridization or some would say you know takeover of of hollywood by silicon valley and the tech companies and now that is like they are actually in within a span of about 
five to seven years, they've become kind of the undisputed hegemons of the entire like movie business. And, you know, but even that goes back so much further to say that, you know, oh, they just started kind of interacting with one another in the 2010s. They do, you know, I mean, these are the two biggest industries in California. You know, it makes sense that they would have overlap going further back. And also just with the 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 Satanism thing. I mean, you know, we've talked a lot about the 60s and that's another big like ontological breakthrough that I think, you know, I, I had over the last few years is that the 60s were not exactly what we were commonly told they were whether whether you kind of agree with the 60s or you think that they were stupid because America rules or so hippies were bad or something like that you know like both of those narratives are kind of wrong and that there was so much more going on in terms of like social manipulation that and and cultural manipulation that is so baked into our culture now that it's like th that that's maybe th that kind of fuels us i think on our deepest dives is we have to unpack all of this this like faulty ontology that has been built over uh, decades and in some cases centuries you know if we're talking about the united states overall that you know to to get at the kind of truth or try to apprehend kind of where we're really at i think you do have to yeah, you have to dig back and then you do fine. I think you're absolutely correct that it ain't nothing new under the sun, as we love to say. Yeah, that's one of so, our, I think a historical methodology is very valuable because there's two, it's really a really dialectical thing. Cause yeah, like as Dimitri said, oftentimes our refrain is that there's nothing new under the sun, which is, you know, something that we say kind of ironically, it's a reference to a kind of a, a reactionary podcast that we stumbled upon a little, a little bit of a, a fascist uh, a convo ongoing between two esteemed mics, but but, uh, yeah, Michael they, Schuer, uh, the Bin Laden hunter. I think that there's a lot of value to historical methodology because, yeah, on one hand, you have what we mentioned, but on the other, it's you, it's often good to have a granular approach and something that is very encouraged when you're dealing with historical topics is to you know, really deal, hone in on the fine differences, the fine distinctions between uh, different things. And you can, do, you can do see, I think, that there are changes. And I think that we try to stress a dialectic between these uh, overarching trends. You, oh, I want to talk about these broad trends, these, uh, you know, things that happen in the long durée versus things that you know, do transform in in the microcosm. And I think that, yeah, that's part of a historical approach is to show the, the changes and to, to show the way these things evolve and develop. And a lot of times, yeah, there are continuities, but there are also breaks. Like, I think that the cultural history, especially the history of art, which you mentioned is very interesting because, you know, at a surface level, a lot of time people get into the sort of hidden world and you know, they want to deal with uh, hidden knowledge like occult uh, subjects you know it's something that is a is perennial topic in, in conspiracy uh, culture and, and conspiracy discourse which is something that we definitely touch on a lot in, in our in our podcast and something that came to this for i think is a good example during the sort of pizzagate discourse it's sort of at the the election time in 2016 was you know marina abramovich you know someone who's like pretty well you known to uh, people who are uh, involved in art or in performance art or have a, a knowledge of that type of thing but this is breaking into a totally different field where people who had never had any contact with this stuff are like what is this like oh my god like you know so it's very interesting yeah. to explore you know these topics are very of great interest to people but there isn't much for one, I think that in general, like in American culture, there's a lack of historical awareness writ large, like people's politics are very underdeveloped because of their lack of, of historical appreciation, but particularly like in the domain of culture and the, the like art is something that's marginalized anyway. It's importance in, in shaping uh, culture and in shaping our, you know, in our society and our, our relationships with, with each other and with different institutions. But I think that in particular, the history of art, the cultural evolution of art and the link between art and the occult and between art and politics and the way that these sort of elite subcultures move together. That's is something that's very interesting and it's a story that's not really well appreciated like within those discursive fields, I think. Mm -hmm. See, I, I don't know. And, and that's where I guess I, when I shot you this uh, email and I said, I, I, I want to get to terra firma <laughs> because, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I just did a book, Why Evil Matters. And the mm -hmm. kind of premise of the book was that we've been intentionally kind of given the bait and, sh bait and switch, not really, but with evil, but we have a materialistic science that says evil doesn't exist. Yeah, it's, you're a biological robot in a meaningless universe. It's a social construct yeah. and nothing wet, more. Wet Don't worry. CPU. A wet CPU. Sloppy yeah. disk. Yeah, mm -hmm. we say these like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but then on the other hand, we, we got 
the, the only other two, we're kind of given this forced choice. Or if you're going to, you know, explore the possibility of evil and what that would mean from for yourself personally, what that would mean, is there a moral imperative? How should I lead my life kind of thing? Then you're kind of forced over to religious dogma. And it says, oh, hold on, buddy. You had a spiritual experience. Let me jump right in the middle of that. Let me be the intermediary between you and your spiritual experience and tell you exactly what it was. See, and I had all this great material and then you blew it because I found out, Khalid, you really are a Muslim. And I was like, whoa, I was gonna do this whole thing on Ed Opperman, whose show you're on. Mm -hmm. and say, I love Ed Opperman, I've supported Ed Opperman on various times, but he's a big tent fundamentalist Christian that believes that there's right. this book that has answers to how we should live our life and talk about conspiracy, which has been my kind of thing lately, is unwilling to explore the possibility that the cons that really the authors of the book were part of a social engineering project and using the mm -hmm. well-worn play of throughout history, but that the Romans really perfected, which is like, sure, rocks and arrows are, are great. But if I can control you by controlling and rescripting your religion, all the better. So I don't know where, where, where to, to me, that kind of trumps the art history thing of getting to the fundamental reality of what we're talking about with something like, evil or satanic or you know whatever these yes. no, players are doing questions are very interesting i mean i think that the best art does deal with those topics and there is a philosophical mm -hmm. dimension to uh the, in, what art engages with i mean even i think that marina abramovich you know her work really does deal with those questions and it has the symbology of it that's so powerful to people is because uh performance art does have a ritual dimension to it which touches on these religious ideas you know that's mm -hmm. uh, it's the intersection that creates the the interest so i think that yeah absolutely you're right and we do uh, often deal with these ideas on the show i mean our show is very heavily uh, inspired by these questions around yeah. uh, religious ontology and uh, these mm -hmm. core concepts but yeah i think that you know well for for one muslims i certainly don't uh, necessarily disagree with uh what you said about about christianity it's a pretty <laughs> uh, common notion but you know, of course, there's. But, but wait a minute, hold on, full, hold on, full stop, full stop. If we're yeah. going to go there, I mean, you guys are still looking at the book and saying the book has all the rules, whether it's the Old well, Testament or whether it's the Quran. You're still saying, hey, it comes through this book, and and to yeah. to let's just be real. For most people, you just go for real. Really, Khaled? That's you believe there's this book. There's well, this magic book. I don't think that that's true for most people. I think that most people do believe something like that about a book, and we don't believe that it's magic. We believe that it's a prophetic revelation from Allah. But the fact is that there's always interpretations of of the book. You know, the interpretation of the book is a is something that happens in between the text itself. You know, there's something. Mm -hmm. And this is something that, you know, Islamic philosophers and Islamic thinkers like always acknowledge that something happens in between the in the act of reading, you know, the Quran is first existed verbally, you know, this is something that, you know, Quran, you know, I Ikra, it's, it's reading and it's also uh, recitation, you know, it's something that when you recite the Quran, it's an act that it takes place with your entire body. And, you know, there's a bit of a digression, but there's always an interpretive practice that happens. And that's why within Islam, there's so many different interpretations of, of the Quran. If you go through history, you know, you even have esoteric sects that interpret the Quran in, in completely different ways. You know, people who read the words, you know, a lot of the Quran isn't cut and dry. Some of it is. And the Quran itself says that some verses are straightforward and others are mejaz. You know, they're they're allegorical. They're open to different sort of interpretations and, and the but it doesn't specify which are which. So there's great uh, sort of a debate about this. You know, the, mm. the divinity of the Quran doesn't really minimize the what you're talking about I, I think or what you're getting at the fact that there is a, a dimension of of human interpretation you know it's about the interaction with the book you know no book exists without the reader you know it only exists in so far as we read it and engage with it and interpret it so to you know the book can't just program us you know it's not like it's a software that we insert into ourselves you know maybe some muslims would like it if that were the case but that's not really just how these religions unfold historically you know uh, for instance ed offerman being a born again christian you know his interpretation of the bible or even the role of the bible is going to be different than from like a catholic or something like that so it, it just doesn't yeah. hold up to the kind of scrutiny and this isn't where i was planning on going with this show but i i've now stacked up about 10 shows on it's got i just got super interested in the the origins of christianity because it really the further you dig in it has all the all the fingerprints of a psyop 
And the real giveaway mm -hmm. is Josephus, right? Josephus, who is the quote unquote Roman historian. He's not really a yes. historian. He's a propaganda right, agent right, for the right. Romans. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. You can't get past Josephus and then just jump right into the Quran and say, oh, we can, it, it all flows together. If Josephus is, is a propaganda agent who is trying to co-opt Judaism in favor of the Roman Empire first is what he does. And I can show you exactly the passage in War of the Jews where he says, hey, you Jews, you got it wrong. You know, we, you've been looking for the Messiah born on our soil. What you really should have been looking at is Vespasian, the emperor, you know, uh, hmm. Titus's father. Yeah, right. He's yeah. really. So the point is, not getting off into that whole thing, which my audience has heard 50 times now, it's getting tired of. You, you, you got to process that in this whole thing. You, you can't say, oh, well, then there's Catholics and there's, well, there's Protestants and they do it this way. And the Mormons have taken. No, if the thing fails at that level, at first century Rome, psyoping religion that then spawns all those religions, Islam and Judaism and Christianity in all its forms, you got to get back. And if it doesn't hold, it doesn't hold. You can't just gloss over it with, you know, convenient, well, it's all allegorical and, you know, the interpretation of it is, I believe that people can have a genuine spiritual experience because the science kind of is overwhelming. For example, the near-death experience science, you can't get past it. It blows neurology, our model of neurology, out of, the, out of the water. And every culture throughout time has said there is such a thing as this spiritual experience. But I just don't think the book thing really holds up. Can I ask a question uh, mm -hmm. related to this? So I, if you believe, and I, I'm, I'm open to entertaining this idea, you, if you believe that, uh, say, Christianity or Judaism and all of the Abrahamic tradition that followed from it was a psyop, do you believe that it was one continuous group or kind of order or something like that? Like, who, who would you posit was behind this? I mean, I guess I, I could definitely see Vespasian and the Romans, particularly from Josephus up to, you know, Theodosius and Constantine, basically co-opting Christianity and then, you know, cloaking themselves in it, you know, in like the 300s. But who would you say, you know, if there is, if the, you know, the, the Jewish text going way, way back, if it was all a psyop, do you think it was the same psyop or do you think it's different elites throughout history have weaponized spiritual uh, ritual practice and religious dogma? I don't know, but I would. I think it's a fantastic question. I would definitely, definitely assume that it's the latter. Because if you really look at the possibility and you explore it, and I'm like in conversation, email and interview conversation with leading, you know, biblical and religious scholars who most of them are telling me I'm full of shit, but some of them are saying, yeah, come on, that's really the only way to kind of process that. But if you do process it, what you wind up with is Josephus's first attempt at this is to kind of co-op Judaism, right? Because mm -hmm. that's when he says Vespasian is the emperor. Well, that has nothing to do with Christianity. It's it's way, mm -hmm. it's actually written after supposedly the historical Jesus lived, but it's really an yeah. attempt just to kind of quell so to, to see it as this kind of continuous psyop that's played over hundreds of years, I think is, is, is silly. But to have it like we see today, you know, it's just, it's a play in the playbook. It's Gloria Steinem, you know, people get tired of hearing me talk about that. It's Gloria Steinem, CIA. Stick uh -huh. her in the women's oh, movement. Yeah. We'll figure out how yep. to use it later. It's Laurel Canyon. Stick yep. those guys up there on the stage. We don't have to have a definitive plan on how we'll use it. Let's just make sure we're in that game kind of thing. So if I had to guess, that's how I think it it, it happens. Mm, okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, I, I, I think I that's a phenomenon that does occur. Oh, yeah. But I don't sure. think that, like, yeah, I kind of agree with Demetrius, at least implication that, I, you know, I think that's a very different thing to talk about the origins of Islam and, and the origins of, of Christianity. You know, I think that there is certainly a Muslim critique of Christianity. You know, we don't really follow the Bible itself. You know, the, the New Testament, we don't believe is, you know, the actual Injil, generally speaking, you know, there might be some some difference. But 
yeah, there's a it's a very different context. You know, and, it's, it's many just hundred to, years later. Yeah, yeah, uh, ju and uh, just also to do what I I love to do on our podcast, which is like uh, shoehorn Marxism into conversations about religion and vice versa. It does <laughs> even remind me of a lot of the time, kind of like the Anthony Sutton, like Hoover Institute type, a sort of conspiracy speculation about Karl Marx, about Lenin, about Trotsky, how, you know, uh, the, I've even heard that, you know, Stalin was was working for the Rothschilds and everything about the history of like the Bolshevik Revolution and 20th century socialism and the Cold War and all that stuff was just like a Hegelian dialectic, ain't nothing new into the sun, just the banker family sponsoring di different factions and 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 that that maybe in a similar way where it's where Khalid would push back on you know intimations that the Quran was cynically like manufactured. I I would too probably eh, maybe Trotsky, but for the most part that you know and regardless of kind of like how the ideas that are you know left behind in these books were kind of taken by other people and instrumentalized and what unfolded in the history after that. I don't know. Maybe it's a kind of thing where you need to have at least something that you choose to put some kind of faith in if you're going to be radically critically paranoid about everything else i don't know but um... well i guess where i'm coming from and, and and then we can kind of ease off of this because terra firma is where i'm coming from so mm -hmm. consciousness and you know like when we did you guys did this survey for me and you played along it was awesome and i, I have such a better sense for where you're coming from and i wouldn't have known otherwise so i appreciate that but where i started this investigation was really kind of looking at it from a scientific standpoint, does the kind of atheist, intellectualized, academia, kind of humanist approach, does it really make sense? That is, you're a biological robot in a meaningless universe, get over it, you know, get your credit card out and go to Black Friday because that's all you have to live for, life is meaningless. And I find that that doesn't, that isn't supportable philosophically and it's really not supportable scientifically at all mm, and I, I came to agree. conclude I came to the conclusion after way too long and way too many interviews that that wasn't an accidental that that was an engineered socially engineered message is to make you feel meaningless mm -hmm. make you feel you have no spiritual connection to anything more because you're easier to control and manipulate so mm. that was my starting point but then that also led me into it, how would we in a pre-scientific, using scientific methods and ideas, how would we explore this extended consciousness that everyone's talking about? And that's why I think it's so interesting, like, because I do want to get back onto the stuff that you guys talk about, because I'm totally sincere in what I said. You guys have this deep dive, and I want to learn from you, because I already do. I, listen, I learn from you every time I listen to your shows. But one thing I always point out to people, I point to MK Ultra, and I point to Project Stargate, which the remote viewing project, which a lot of people go, wait, wait, remote viewing. No, remote viewing is MK Ultra. And if you go listen to Hal Putoff and Russell Targ, they say, when Sidney came to see us, being Ooh. Sidney Gottlieb, <laughs> yep. you know, he was the boss. He was the guy. Well, the point of all that is remote viewing and so many of the other MK Ultra programs presuppose an extended yeah. consciousness b yes. that is beyond our body. And some of them presuppose whatever that satanic, whatever we're going to call it, that there are these other beings in these extended realms that may be malevolent, but hey, we got to go see, let's go check them out kind of thing. So yeah, let's I, go hang out with, with Jin. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, Jin, right. I, I love the I love I was gonna share that last show, you know, Bigfoot is a Jin kind of thing. I, I love that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. The, the, the point being, I, I think I'm not poking at Islam to like make some joke. I'm poking at it because I think we fundamentally, in order to understand Aquino, in order to understand the military industrial complex, which is completely wrapped around, inseparable from Michael Aquino, mm -hmm. I think we have to understand what there is there when it comes to these extended consciousness realms. And the, if we're, if your definition of those extended consciousness realms is, wait, let me get my book out, then I'm like, whoa, I'm not so sure on that, Ed Opperman. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think that, well, for one, to me, what you're talking about in terms of spiritual experience, you know, to me, like the Quran is a sort of a record of like a profound spiritual moment in time, you know, and I think that that is why people uh, look to this. And I think that 
that is in terms of trying to understand these type of things, the spiritual dimension of, of human life. Uh, I think part of the side you're talking about, part of the attempt to sort of disconnect us from our, our the spiritual component of, of human experience and to make us feel like what CPUs and sloppy disks. Part of that is, you know, to go back to the, the, to the topic of history, part of that is the, the disconnect from religious tradition, from all the work and all the effort that has been poured into these subjects because whatever you want to say about them. And yeah, like there are like flaws, there may be blind spots in those traditions that we now are better equipped to address uh, lacunae, but there really is like a great wealth of information and the problems that we intercept now when we try to take approach these problem these topics, they have been encountered before, but people lack the historical awareness, they lack these uh, appreciation for, and this is true, of religious people as well as people who aren't religious. You know, there I think that there's a general disconnect with the history of, of people's own traditions. And I think that that is something that, yeah, you definitely absolutely can learn about these topics because it does belong to the same realm. Like if you're talking about Satan, you know, you're talking about these beings, talking about jinn, things like that, you know, that is where a lot of the work, a lot of the groundwork yeah. has been laid. And a lot of the, there's a great continuity between, and people like Aquino, you know, they go back to those ideas, you know, Aquino might go back to the Nazis or whatever, and the Nazis are going to, you know, runic paradigms as a process by theosophy or whatever, or like the, you know, some the racist, society. Like, esoteric, yeah, idea of like the Vedas. Yeah, exactly. But these occult traditions are obviously dealing with the their remixes or engagements with, and oftentimes they're imagined as being some kind of old, long-standing, subversive underground movement within these religious traditions, you know, they're to deal with like the intellectual history of, of religions like Christianity or Islam or yeah, whatever the other large religions, you know, that is part of like a study of these things because they do use the same terms. Like if, you know, yeah, see, summoning it, demons, you know, it's the same thing as like John D summoning demons, you know, they, these things have right, a relationship. Right. But yeah, uh, Colin, I guess what I'm proposing is that it's all a head fake. It's all unnecessary because the, the what we're really talking about is that there is this extended realm that can manifest itself in an unlimited number of ways. And there's a malevolent mm -hmm. part of that. So to mm -hmm. identify it and label it this way, that way, you know, oh, it's uh, Baphomet in this case. No, that's Lucifer. No, that's, you know, is just kind of part of the problem of that need to know that, you know, kind of need to kind of categorize it and that spiritual disintermediation is not that hard anyone can go within anyone can say that what i'm really trying to do is connect with my heart to love everyone and tell the truth we've got some fundamental simply simple ideas that you know i can read one passage from the quran right i can throw the rest away yeah. all i need to do mm -hmm. is try and be a good person so i would almost you know, I just think we need to explore the possibility that the exact opposite of what you're saying is true, is that these uh, d disconnecting from religious traditions is exactly what we need to do. And connecting directly with the spirituality, if it exists, is within us. And that's why I say, you know, you want to go study the Quran? Screw it. I'll give you a better place. It's N-D-E-R-F dot org so you can go search through three thousand people that have had a near-death experience and they're all over the board there's uh muslims there's christians there's jews there's people who are not religious and they're having a direct spiritual experience that to me sounds a lot more unfiltered un uncorrupted and it's just there it's it's available to everyone and it's not just nde of course you can do all sorts of different practices but the point is it's not hard to connect with god god's always there the light the light's always on they're always home you know just of go course, there no it's not sure hard to sure it's not hard to connect with god but it's also not hard to connect with with satan you know it's not yeah as a kind of maybe the, the 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 person in the middle here between religiosity or not religiosity i would just say if we are presupposing uh, a field of consciousness or you know existence or whatever beyond our kind of normative senses and uh, consciousness after death and all these things and, the, and we're positing the existence of a spirit world then i think actually it's not i don't think it's uh it's too outlandish to lay down maybe some, and maybe this is kind of a, a very just basic practical utility that, that organized religion, religious traditions serve, is to kind of give you like a, a little bit of like some guide rails 
if you're going to delve into that world because if you're doing it completely it's just like you know we've done episodes not necessarily about ouija boards and seances and teenagers uh, trying to summon the devil you know when they're teenagers it's not necessary don't try and summon the devil just okay, go yeah. to the, no, just go enough. to the light love <laughs> love everyone and you know it's it really isn't that complicated and religion has has orchestrated this idea that it that again it's intermediary that i need to be the intermediary don't you dare you know don't go out without your mask on don't you go it's kind of a version of that it's like of course you need us to guide you through that realm no the it, it's it's all the the evidence and i'm, I'm stretching the word a little bit but again, if you look at the science of near-death experience, and I've just interviewed two of the OG researchers, respected University of Virginia, Dr. Bruce Grayson, and then just Evan Alexander just earlier in the week. I mean, that's just solid science. The best, uh, one of the top resuscitation experts in the world, you know, all of them line up and say, hey, these people are dead. The experiences that they're having post-death are unexplainable inside of our neurological model. I like that base of information right off the bat because that mind trickery is out of the is out of the is out of the question. So when they come back consistently and say this is a, it, that it isn't that complicated and they come back consistently overwhelmingly and say, you know, if you need if you need a religion, if you want that, if that's your thing great, but there's no such thing as it's just not necessary what comes through again and again. Hmm. I, well, I feel that the, for one, I think there's always some mediation in terms of experience. I think that the reason why we have these traditional accruals of knowledge and why there even is a practice of spiritual techniques or, or technologies of the self, things like prayer, things like meditation, like why there are traditions of these things and why there are occult practices as well is because people have attempted to do these things. And of course, you know, what you're saying really is also like a well, a well tested and old idea, you know, for from time immemorial, people have been like all this, you know, all the right. systemization has accrued. We always need to like break away and, you know, go back to, I mean, this is, for instance, in Islam, you know, this is an idea as well. You know, there's the idea of getting away from the exoteric or even there's an elitist component where they're like, you know, the exoteric is for people who can't quite get it. But, you know, we're at a different level of, of the Shia, you know, we're above all these things. But, you know, our brotherhood for whatever reason or this, you know, association. But I, you know, I think that there, for instance, any of those experiences, you know, what would you say to people who have experienced hell like in any of that experience or people who what about the whole like tricked by the light? narrative you know i was recently hearing about someone who had any other experience that was very very positive you know and they had been sort of welcomed by these alien beings you know sort of in a gray alien mold you know again like like there is some consistency in these in these experiences but there's also a great deal of, of divergence you know some people see jesus some people see this you know but anyway in this experience the person had seen these gray aliens and it was a, a loving peaceful experience but afterwards you know they went underwent regressing hypnosis and they were basically prompted uh, by the hypnotist to only experience the truth of, you know, what they had seen. And then their memory changed. It became a horrifying experience where, in fact, they were like, you know, violated and, say, you know, abused by these same beings, you know, and that they, they came to view it as a screen memory. What they had experienced mm -hmm. is this, you know, beautiful experience. They thought, oh, you know, this was a false memory that had been implanted. And the, what really happened was what I now am remembering. Now, I just feel like there's a lot of hairiness there. You know, it could be the other way around. It could be that in the experience of hypnosis, this new memory came to the fore and the original experience was the authentic one. But there's a lot of muddiness there. You know, it's very mm -hmm. hard to, to really say, but that is someone's experience of it. You know, so I think that these th there's a lot of hairiness in the near that experiences beyond, you know, uh, people do see hell. People, you know, have very yeah, doctrinaire that. religious experiences, you know, and some yeah. people have. And I, I do. Yeah. I do wonder yeah. to what extent people like on that website you referenced come out of some kind of religious upbringing or tradition that I'm not saying that it's all a projection of their imagination and it's fake or anything like that, but that perhaps the imagery, the symbolic imagery of whatever they're seeing, because, you know, we're also talking about, right, I, I'm presuming that, you know, that that whole thing about DMT being released as you die and all that. I'm not again, I'm not saying that that means that these experiences are fake or just hallucinations. But I think in general, with certainly with hallucinogen drugs, that the shape of the of 
the hallucinations or visions or even beings that you might meet are sometimes uh, to a certain extent mediated by your own kind of experience and imagination and it kind of would make sense even if it was authentic that maybe it would use symbols that have meaning to you so you know bright light heaven you know everybody knows that iconography that was raised remotely christian you know you go up oh there's clouds there's a bright light you hear a voice or you you're going to hell in a bucket and there's flames and it's hot and it's scary you know and things like that so i mean it just it's very hairy it's like hard to fully to confidently fully disentangle those things so mm -hmm. there, there's a lot to kind of process there i always use the term pre-scientific because the we are not at a stage where we can start calling things scientific but to a certain extent you know as soon as we get past materialistic science as soon as we get past the double slit experiment of 190 whatever we are post materialism the double slit experiment should really be called a consciousness experiment because it shows that consciousness affects the photon pattern and that experiment is then directly replicated by a guy named dr dean radin who says well screw it these guys are arguing over the philosophy of it i'll set it up modern day in the last few years with a photon beam and a person that I'm gonna put in there a meditator and say, okay, affect the photon beam. And he you know, gets a six sigma result that kind of once and for all clears up any confusion about whether or not the observer effect is real. I digress there to say that the consciousness part is really where we start. And, and we have to realize that once you get into that, then materialistic science, even though science, we both agree, or we all agree science is a method, not a position statement it is still kind of science as we know it is kind of a position statement that suggests that we can the world is out there we can measure the world and we can somewhat control the world and this post-materialistic science suggests well that's not really the case and we can kind of shut up and calculate and pretend like the world is out there and we can build all these cool gadgets from it but deep down we got to admit it's not really there but switching gears for a minute back over to near-death experience harry yes but everything is hairy and this is part of the process that you know we go through and that i admire about the way you do it you guys do it on subliminal jihad and it's what i try and do too but it's like like the dmt thing great uh, dmt is the actually what's what people are experiencing the near-death experience great trace that down sam harris is i think the guy who said it sam harris is full of shit. he just is oh it's yeah been, i agree it's yeah. been studied it's been studied so often and so thoroughly by near-death experience researchers these are phd level people these are people who publish in peer-reviewed journals like the lancet the one of the most highly respected medical journal in the world and they've they've looked for dmt in the blood samples they've looked for other other chemicals not there as a matter of fact it kind of oh, shows okay, just okay shows just the opposite but the important thing gotcha. about that is sam harris is not only full of shit, but he's actually best understood as a disinfo agent because if you look at the pushback that came when near-death experiences hit like i don't know 10 years ago it really made it big with this guy dr eben alexander who's a harvard neurosurgeon who published this book proof of heaven because oh yeah, yeah i remember this, that yeah, and I just had him on earlier in the week. He got an unbelievable cultural takedown, and we covered it on this show, but an unbelievable, intentional, wildly ridiculous, you know, like Sam Harris said, well, he's not qualified to talk on that because he, he, he's not a neuroscientist. Uh-huh. The, Sam, the guy <laughs> taught at Harvard Medical School as a neurosurgeon. Yeah. That is such an absurd statement. But people, you know, people don't look past that. They just go, oh, maybe he's not, maybe he's not qualified. Maybe the doc, yeah, anyways, it's yeah, a cultural yeah, takedown. The I point being. I would agree with that. Yeah, with Sam Harris. Yeah, yeah, yeah we are, we're a very anti-Sam Harris podcast. Yes, it's, uh, <laughs> really, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, and his whole interest in like meditation, of course, he's like one of these arch, like anti-religious polemicists, but he's also like a new ager kind of. I remember his remarks like, people don't understand me because they don't really know meditation. He's probably, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Jen are probably telling him what to say, you know, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he's, he came out of Stanford, right? I don't know that. That's interesting. And his mom know. was a Golden Girls writer, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure that sounds, that yeah. sounds definitely true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the other thing I was just going to throw on, because I don't want to do the whole NDE lecture on you guys, but 
this stuff has been done. So you you do you know the hellish near death experiences. I've interviewed a couple of people who've had those kinds of experiences. I interviewed Pastor Howard Storm, who had one of the most horrific hellish experiences. Definitely out there, underreported. You know, people don't want to say they went to hell. You <laughs> know, people then yeah. immediately look at him and go, "Yeah, what did you do to go to hell?" But it, it it's it's there it has to be understood in this pre-scientific how can we get their way but the other thing i'd throw this out at you guys and then i'll leave it leave it go it's another super interesting guy is dr gregory shushan and what he did is a cross-culture cross-time analysis of near-death experience and he's an academic oxford connected guy so he has to play it kind of very in a very narrow thing and has to be kind of this pseudo you know i agnostic kind of thing but it's it's just clear what he's saying is that over and over again in all these different religious traditions through like go to you know polynesia you know 500 years ago accounts that and then go to native americans and go to africans and take all these different accounts and you see the same thing people are having over long periods of time, having near-death experiences. And his conclusion is that all these religions uniformly are based on near-death, I should say, the after their description of the afterlife of all these religions across all these cultures mm. are based on near-death experiences. And he even points out many cases where they had a certain set of beliefs about the afterlife and then someone within their community had a near-death experience they go oh man that that's it that sounds like that's definitely it we believe you and their <laughs> beliefs changed based on that mm -hmm. so there's a lot there's a lot there and i'm not saying that's terra firma but i'm saying we're never going to understand michael aquino unless we're unless we're willing to take a couple of steps in that direction you know so it, i agree yeah absolutely yeah you have to you have to presuppose something out there kind of beyond on the other side whatever you want to call it to be able to wrap your head i think around somebody like aquino or yeah, this I type agree. of these, and, these type of mystery cults or whatnot you know yes uh, and yeah. just because i just because i follow one religious tradition doesn't mean that i believe that there's no knowledge of god like in other cultures you know i think that there really is something yeah again i believe that there's an ontological reality to this stuff and so that people are describing similar things you know the god that is you know ahura mazda or whatever the you know high god of zoroastrianism like that is a way of talking about allah you know it's the same thing like in hinduism like all these avatars and all this proliferation of things you know maybe krishna at one time was a prophet or something you know these are representations or a way of interacting with something i mean really like the whole idea of a perennialism or the idea there's something to all religions like the notion of Abrahamic religions or of people of the book, you know, or people who have a semblance of a book like that's an old Islamic concept, you know, in a way we have a Islam to thank for that idea of this sort of intercompatibility. This is something that was recognized early on in, on, in Islamic history that there's, uh, you know, an access to, to this that other religions have as well. And th there there's a gradations of, of religious truth and that, you know, and of course, in various traditions within Islam, you know, there's the idea that our, there's a but sort of the ideas of heaven and hell, for instance, like Al Ghazali, who's like a very famous uh, Muslim philosopher, you know, very influential Muslim theologian who, you know, I don't know what your listenership is like, but he just gets bad rap in some circles. But, you know, he said that those who pray because they fear hell, you know, or because they desire Horis or, you know, the garden, like they'll get that. But those of us who pray because we want to, you know, witness the face of God, like we'll see the face of God and that will be more beautiful than a uh, hori by the same order of magnitude that a hori is more beautiful than uh you know a woman here on earth you know uh, which of course is like very misogynistic typical you know medieval person but you get the point like that there is an idea of a gradations of experience like even within traditions themselves so yeah i, I definitely think that you know there is these are attempts to describe something that is simply out there and you know in terms of aquino yeah, like, you know, he has a very different take on it where he's like embracing the evil dimension, although he may not necessarily see it that way. You know, he, he has his own kind of flexible morality, but he's dealing in the same sphere with the same concepts. Like he understands mm -hmm. this basic language that is compatible among these different. See, I, I don't like think those, he yeah. is. He's dealing in a realm, one, of deception, 
which mm-hmm. is an intersection with your show in that I can say or do anything because do what thou wilt is the is the ultimate truth, you know, and mm-hmm. I think that there's a, a, a contrary point of view that I'm pointing to, and that I think fundamentally you are too, that says, no, uh, there is a moral imperative to do good and not and, and not do bad. And to do bad and to be deceptive is out of a line with what, for lack of a better term, you know, God, spirit, the light, whatever, it's out of sync. It's ignorance, what the Buddhists yeah. call ignorance of the true, what's really going on. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, no, no I, I, agree, I, I agree. I agree with that. Yeah, I think that what I mean to say is that he's yeah, using the same terms. He's a- acting within the same basic language, like in- invoking Satan and aligning himself with that. He's saying that he's in opposition to those things, but that is still, you know, within the same like conceptual universe. You know, he's not saying that like something completely turned on its head. Like, yeah, he uses deceit and like maybe he uses these language, these terms in deceitful ways. But if you approach it like you can understand it through this, these, these language and these, these concepts, you know, and he uses them himself, you know, yeah, like uh, something that actually does, I infiltrated the temple of said, you know, I've read like their internal documents, you <laughs> know, like, I love uh, that. Yeah, I love yeah. that. So yeah, like, and a lot of it is, I mean, they have their own reading lists and things like that. And they'll refer you to, you know, what they encourage their members to read, like are things, you know, they encourage people to read things written by Christian theologians, like something that we talked about on our uh, our episode about Dog Man that will be out soon, you know, the, the <laughs> book of werewolves. And they have a whole reading list about werewolves, of course, a topic uh, that's of great interest to, to Satanists in, in general, but especially to those who have a, a sympathy with the SS or whatever, you know. So, uh, you know, he would recommend these religious texts about werewolves. So these things, the whole idea of we're going to take as our emblem the symbol of of evil in the christian tradition you know we're going to commune with the the devil you know that is something that is based on it's the inversion yeah. playbook mm-hmm. it's sabbatean frankish you know redemption through sin right it's yeah, rede- yeah. let's do the because hey i can look right in my scriptures and it says you know, he's going to come the redemption will come when everyone is good or everyone is bad well we've tried everyone everyone being good that ain't working let's all just be bad because that'll bring about the second coming you know yeah, it's like accelerationism for you know it's like a spiritual yes. accelerationism um, but it's always yeah, an inversion is... it's always a deceptive mm-hmm. inversion it's a, and it's such a low level simple play but it, it does seem to attract a lot of people it yeah. does, and, it, and yeah. I see it seeping into the groundwater yeah. of our culture increasingly, which does alarm me. And you know, I was raised Catholic, but I don't, I, I wouldn't, I would say my my sort of relationship with it is like ambivalent and ambiguous or whatever. But I would say I'm I'm like theistic, so let's say I'm not an atheist. But I noticed that, and it's interesting you brought up Sam Harris because he embodied this kind of. You know, we make fun of it a lot on the podcast, people like Bill Maher and Sam Harris, you know, talking about people being religious and how, you know, flying spaghetti monsters. But it was all based yeah. in this kind of scientistic kind of thinking that was very just anti, basically denying spirit, the spiritual universe that, that we've been discussing. And it just doesn't exist. That's ridiculous. Shut up. You're dumb. You're superstitious. But now I think as that has been kind of, I feel like that's petering out a little bit in the culture, that kind of scientific atheism, or it's it's been having a rough ride because things are so insane and so chaotic and there's so much madness going on. And maybe people are in some way a little more drawn to some kind of spiritual explanation. But now you're seeing things where like the amount of satanic imagery in like pop culture, we talk about it a lot in like music videos, like de- demonic MK ultra satanic type imagery, you know, or like twerking on Satan literally is now being held up as like this, a really cool, just like even just, just kind of a bland, like progressive, cool thing. But it's not very different in my mind from something like the satanic temple or the church of Satan embracing the sigil of Baphomet, which is the like quintessential embodiment, you know, symbol of evil in the Christian tradition, which is the kind of the dominant majority tradition in, you know, Western society. So it's, there's a sense of, you know what you're doing, you know what that represents. And regardless of whether or not, even if you, even if you accept a totally atheistic view of the world, that still represents something that is most, most people would commonly agree represents evil values. 
you know, the, yeah. the person who is the opposite of Jesus Christ, who, again, it's like, even if you don't, if you just think it's a fairy tale, Jesus right. uh, exemplified a lot of virtues that, like, the majority of humanity would think are positive virtues to model, whereas Satan is all about deception, lies, power, greed, everything else. And, you know, this is in America on top of that, a place where we already have a bit of a spiritual problem with greed, power, genocide imperialism etc and business and just getting more 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 you know down to you know it's like a root of our kind of capitalistic protestant work ethic spirituality so you know throwing satan into the mix to turbo boost our consumerist hyper materialist kind of empty secular culture seems you know it's like i i, I stop and take notice when that happens and i think it's that a play that, yeah that, yeah, it's a play. And I think it has an impact. I mean, even if people, you know, what you hear nowadays is like, well, you know, the satanic temple just says that, you know, they, they're just atheists. They're just doing it to rile up the Christians. But, you know, I just kind of fundamentally don't accept that as like an explanation. I mean, sure, maybe if that if that's what you think it is, but it you're still using you're weaponizing uh, a symbol that most people believe represents evil. It's like same thing with like flying a swastika or an SS banner. You know, just say, oh, I yeah. just think it looks cool. It doesn't really mean I'm a Nazi, you know? <laughs> right, or I'm doing it ironically, you know? Yeah, yeah. and I think that this part of the whole, you know, the old cliche about, like, the greatest trick the devil ever played is in some ways true. It, you know, it speaks to, I think, the larger point of, like, the illiteracy about symbols and the, you know, illiteracy about different understandings of these figures of religious ideas and also of, of history. And I think that, you know, for instance, you mentioned the twerking on the devil. You know, this is a huge... Uh, flashpoint in our culture, like, a huge controversy over uh, Lil Nas X's video uh, with the devil in it. And, uh, you know, this is a huge thing where people were upset at uh, the suggestion of uh, giving Satan a lap dance and things like that. And, you know, other people were saying, like, how, you know, can you be upset? You know, this is all symbology. This is all metaphor. And something, a common point that people made vis-a-vis -vis the video was that, well, you know, look at the ending, you know, little Nas X, actually, he's using his sexuality to seduce the devil, but in the end, he kills the devil, and then he puts the devil's horns on himself, so really, he's killing Satan, so isn't that good? And it's like, well, you know, if you think about what these people, like Michael Aquino, for instance, what they really believe, like, that actually matches up perfectly with their mm -hmm. ideas about their, how their relationship with these entities work. You know, they, of course, no one is ever going to do like no one's ever going to sign on to like the Christian idea of a deal with the devil like that people will warn you about, you know, like uh, what the devil came to you and said, you're going to be my slave and you're going to do my will and then you're going to burn forever. You know, no one would take that deal, probably, <laughs> you yeah. know, it's because they think that they have a loophole. They always have a way out, you know, and oftentimes it's because they can ascend themselves. They can become, you know, the dark prince or, you know, the god unto themselves. That's exactly what Setianism teaches, like, mm -hmm. uh, which is... Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, a vulgar, more secularized version of that in the Church of Satan and an even further more uh, secularized version of that in the, the Satanic Temple, where you have the idea that there, you know, you can yourself. It's all about the, the aggrandizement of the self, you know, the ascension of the self, the mm -hmm. godhood of, of the becoming the a god. Yeah, yes. exactly. They think that they're, they're not going to be accountable because they will, you know, find a loophole that they will become they will become set. Set is within. Yeah, them. yeah. And we're on the verge of this kind of new frontier where I think even people like Sam Harris have talked about, you know, the 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 rumblings around transhumanism right. are have been picking up for, you know, a couple decades now. And clearly these psychos like like Jeffrey Epstein and his best friend Bill Gates are pretty interested in life extension technologies and okay all full pause because you guys dropped a truth bomb on me and uh we got it jeffrey epstein what's that really all about jeffrey epstein gifted children mm. well yeah, we talk, we're yeah, still we looking into that that yeah. was uh that that was a lead that our our buddy uh, jimmy fallon gong discovered and yeah we we talked about that with him, I think we're still digging into it because we're still finding more and more yeah, people this is that a maybe big, 
Yeah, an interesting, very interesting angle on this is Jeffrey Epstein's life as a gifted child, you know, and Jimmy, what he did was draw like a very interesting connection between him and figures like Jack Sarfati and uh, mm-hmm. Whitley Stryber, who you actually had in your show. I mean, Whitley Stryber's actual life, you know, it's a bit muddy, like one doesn't quite know, but the theme in his putatively autobiographical work of like a secret school involving communion with the ET entities and the description by Jack Sarfati and Daniel Sheehan of getting this call on the God phone. Mm -hmm. And what we did in our episode dealing with this topic with Jimmy was we kind of brought this idea through the discussion of this sort of uh, idea of gifted children, Jeffrey Epstein's past, and, uh, you know, being involved in gifted children programs and Walter Breen, you know, who's another big figure in the development of those programs in the United States. And Walter you know, Breen, who that, is yeah. a convicted pedophile at the same time. Yeah, he's and part of founder writer, of, the co-founder uh, of Coin. Mambla. Yeah, co-founder of is, Mambla. Yeah. And, and a poster um, child, too, has the look. Hey, but you guys mentioned uh, Strieber, Whitley Strieber. Did, did you know about his gifted children participation that mk ultra program when he was like seven or nine years old yeah well in his book he describes a secret school you know in fact it's more according to him you know it's uh it's more than that you know it's not only that he was part of like a government secret school program it's that he you know of course later in life Lily Schreiber maintains that he was a, a victim of alien abduction repeatedly and but, but hold, hold on because yeah, yeah. i interviewed him i interviewed him on this and we specifically talked about because I was very interested in the MK Ultra program, and you guys are so up to speed on this, and we can go there, and I want to go there. Mm-hmm. But people don't understand how extensive it was, you know. And people go, mm-hmm. Ted Kaczynski, Unabomber, ha ha ha. No, man, that's just the. You, that's an Another undeniable. Another gifted child, if you think about it. A, exactly. A Went there at mm-hmm. sixteen, so I don't think it was exactly. random that he got picked to go into that study. And, and right. So I'm totally down with what you guys are saying. And Henry Murray, you know, is the Dr. Henry Murray at, at Harvard, you know, picks out a guy like Ted Kaczynski. It is there's absolutely completely solid evidence that they're doing this all over the place and they're doing it. And then I interviewed another guy and I won't even mention his name, but he's a podcaster. And he tells me, you know, I'm telling the story about Whitley Strieber and he goes, yeah, when I was in kindergarten, I was a gifted child. I'm like, whoa, stop. Tell me. He goes, really? what was the weirdest thing? The weirdest thing, we just went in this room and all day we just memorized cards. We just tried to memorize these cards. Yeah. And it's like, mm-hmm. we will never know the extent to which these guys did these programs, some of which sound incredibly benign, like that one. And the, yeah. the one that Whitley was in. And but you that know, probably I, I, did have to do with psychic abilities. That probably by memorizing cards, he meant that they tried to predict the shape on cards without seeing them. You know, I, I, maybe, ex- That's what maybe, I imagine. and you could uh, get there, right? You could get there in a, a whole bunch of different ways, Khaled, right? You could just have people memorize information and that could be a pre-screening to whether they go to the next thing. But back to Whitley, mm-hmm. because when I interviewed Whitley, I asked him specifically about this and you can hear his voice and you hear him, him struggling with this and he struggled with it a great deal in terms of trying to resolve it back in his life. But the full story is he's like, I don't know, nine years old and his dad is in military intelligence, by the way, and oh, wow. they, they come knocking on the door and uh, they say, hey, you know, we've got a special program for gifted children. It's down at the Air Force Base here in San Antonio. and. Whitley like barely remembers it, but he remembers going in a Faraday cage. He remembers them mutilating animals and doing this other stuff. He doesn't remember all of it, but what he remembers are a couple things. After that, mom insisted that he get dressed up in his Sunday morning to go in his Sunday best to go to school. And he was like, went up on the roof to try and hide to get away from these guys. And he su- mm-hmm. suggests that the only way he got out of it is that he got quote unquote sick and got sent to the hospital. Probably, you know, your body reacts to that because I got to get it, find a way out of here. He goes to the hospital and his mother comes there and they eventually pull him out of the program. But he says in trying to recollect what really happened, because I, I Whitley is trying to understand this. I get the sense that he is an honest broker. He just has this fragmented, shattered disassociative identity created memory of what's Mm -hmm. going on. But he said, look, the fucking kid across the street, I know he was there with me. When that kid came back, he was shattered. He never left the house. He was 50 years old. He had never left the house virtually and died, you know, in his room. And I talked to another kid 
down the street who they put him in, they went to put him in the program and the parents said, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't sound right. We're not doing it. But he was able to confirm through talking to some of his other childhood friends that it wasn't made up, that there definitely was such a program. And, you know, it's don't look so yeah. good. Yeah, uh, no, it's, no, it's a mean, really yeah. kind of, it, it, I think it's almost kind of a conceptual breakthrough across the board with con a lot of conspiracy topics that we've covered. This idea Agreed. of, like, we ne I just never really thought about the gifted children program, even though we had talked all about, you know, the rumored Project Monarch and, you know, the Fritz Springmeier stuff about, oh, you got to do these terrible things to, like, small children before they're six to induce, you know, dissociative identity disorder. We talked about hypnotism and George Estabrooks talking about the importance, and Milton Erickson talking about the importance of how you can hypnotically induce multiple personalities. But then the gifted child thing was like, oh, my God. And then when I started thinking back on it, we had already done some digging into other characters that actually do have this, you know, it's not just uh, Sarfati and Epstein, we're still, you know, nailing it down, but Michael Aquino, for example, I don't know if he specifically was a child, but his mother was. Tell his that mother story. Was, was an incredible. Tell, tell that story, guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell, yeah, tell yeah, that yeah. story so, about, about his mother and about his grandfather and about his whole family, because oh, it, it's another God, one of yeah. these. It does the total flip and you're like, oh my God, I hate this guy. I hate this guy. Oh my God, I feel so sorry for this guy. Yeah, did he realize that he had to have been born into something weird? Because, okay, so just to, this is stuff that we dug up when we were researching our very first Aquino episodes, uh, like number three and four. And what I was able to find mostly through Amazon book descriptions that Aquino himself had published, um, <laughs> including a book of his mom's poetry and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, um, Pegasus I, and Pin Feathers. Yeah, yeah Pegasus uh, and Pin Feathers. I, I discovered mm -hmm. that, you know, his mother, Betty, who went by Betty Ford Aquino, was a kind of a girl from a well off, fan, a well off San Francisco family. And I also, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, so all this like hits close. Like, I, I, I'm fascinated by, I never understood kind of this world of like old San. San Francisco, like robber baron society and stuff. And but I, I realized and I never thought that Aquino would be kind of grow up in the center of it. But basically, his mother was born in San Francisco, like the, the beginning of the century. And she was identified at a young age as being an extremely gifted child prodigy. And so her parents sent her to Stanford University uh, as part of an experimental gifted child, uh, kind of both a study and a program. And it was run by a psychologist named Dr. Lewis Terman, who was an extremely prominent psychologist in the early 20th century, also one of the most prominent eugenicists in the United States at that time, like a fervent yeah. eugenicist mm -hmm. and yes. supported uh, California's like forced sterilization program and, and all their his eugenics work program. With yeah, and all of his work with gifted children was inflected heavily by his interest in, in this and trying to understand, you know, which races are more intelligent, things like that. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So she, you know, she went through this program, and then kind of like Ted Kaczynski, you know, at, I think at 15 or 16, she enrolled in Stanford, and then graduated. And then after she left Stanford, I believe this was in the early 1930s, she spent a number of years in Nazi Germany studying sculpture with a famous uh, sculptor named George Kolba. Sure. Yeah. And Aquino in some Google groups threads or Usenet threads back in the day told some very weird stories about how his grandmother and his mother were in a in a restaurant in Berlin one time in the 30s and the early <laughs> yeah. 30s and there was there was a boisterous group of snappily dressed uniformed men you know causing a ruckus and his grandmother who is a, a very you know San Francisco grand dame got up and told them to cut it out and the head of the table you know apologized profusely and it turned out it was Adolf Hitler and you know he just thought yeah, that was a fun uh, Story. But, but uh, Grandmama didn't recognize him because she she found politics vulgar. Yeah, yeah he. he I, sure. I still, I believe that his grandmother's name was was uh, her maiden name was Sophie Johnson. Now there was a Sophie Johnson Vanderbilt from the nineteenth century. I don't know if she was named kind of in reference to that, or I don't know. I, I, her uh, Aquino called her a, a grand dame of the Stanford Crocker era of San Francisco, but right. yet I can't find I can't trace. her her family. But anyway, so, you know, she was in Nazi Germany throughout most of the 1930s. There were some rumors that she had an affair with an SS officer at one point. Queen but then mother, in 1934, yeah, yeah Aquino's mm -hmm. mother. And then right. uh, the, the other thing I discovered, well, there's two things about his grandfather, who was a surgeon, uh, a prominent surgeon, Dr. Campbell Ford, that 
uh, really f- made my head spin that I found, you know, on yeah, newspapers.com. Mm-hmm. Com. The first one was from, I believe it was from the San Francisco Examiner in 1894. And it was an article about how a prominent doctor, Dr. Campbell Ford, Michael Aquino's grandfather, had been arrested in San Francisco for allegedly attempting to steal a baby. Like he was running around with a baby that wasn't his. Yeah. And- <laughs> He, that's yeah. normal really weird yeah, yeah. it was like so busy because especially because then if you know about the presidio his abuse story scandal, was that like, like just 100 a years random, later yeah his story was like a random person just like drop the baby in his lap or something right like he was just like someone came up to me and like the, gave me this baby and i was like oh, yeah it was like, some, like a it. saloon yeah. owner gave him a baby maybe there was an implication that it was sort of somebody had a baby out of wedlock and then they just they showed they just gave it to him for some reason to go and give it to yeah. a foundling place or an orphanage but he mm-hmm. had hired like a, a stagecoach you know a, a buggy you know a cabbie whatever to like ride him around san francisco with this baby and the cabbie's story contradicted the grandfather's story campbell ford's story you know campbell ford said that he was attending to the birth in a saloon of this baby and then like they gave him the baby and he went and tried to find it a home but the the cabbie said that he just hired him they pulled up to a saloon somebody walked out and just handed him a baby and then he's like go around town and started going to different places around town apparently try i don't know it's like he was he trying to sell it or something it was very it, it, very bizarre and that was like on the front page of the san francisco examiner in 1894 and then the other big thing about campbell ford who was i think in three different frame freemasonic lodges by the way including a knights templar commandery the mount moriah lodge number 44 he died in 1934 by slitting his own throat with a straight razor and yeah. some newspapers, it was reported actually in a bunch of different newspapers that some of them implied that it was kind of an accident while he was shaving. Other ones said <laughs> right. a presumed suicide. And then other ones noted ironically that Ms. Dr. Ford was somewhat famous in the medical community for inventing a, a type of suture, a, a type of suture known as the Ford stitch. So there's almost, I think as Khaled pointed out in that episode, there's like a weird like satanic irony of the doctor who invented this famous stitch ends up slicing his own throat open. And by the way, in the the big spooky house on Leavenworth Street in San Francisco that Michael Aquino would end up living in in the 1980s, like that he both grew up in and ended up inheriting until he died in 2019. And also that, that is the house where the children who accused him in the Presidio said they were taken to, which had all these weird rooms. That's where they, you know, that's where the police raided his home was uh, that exact same home where his grandfather slit his own throat in 1934. So, I mean, and Dimitri, just to add, maybe you want to add to that. I mean, we have to say, you know, alleged and this and that, but anyone who just does a kind of cursory examination of the evidence against him for uh, pedophilia and his wife of being part of it, it's it's so overwhelming. And I mean, it, it, it's just, it's overwhelming evidence. I mean, he, he did all that stuff. I would agree. Yeah, I would agree. And then the fact that the daycare center, the Presidio was burnt down twice, or there were two attempts to burn it down while this kind of process was, uh, while this trial process was was playing itself out. And then the second time, I believe that when they successfully burned it down, it was on the night of the autumnal equinox. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, kind of interesting. And then, you know, all these things were dropped, but also the army refused. I remember finding a, a kind of a lawsuit judgment or something. I think it was like from the army's, you know, legal division, basically refusing Aquino's request to completely expunge the Presidio stuff from his record, which is interesting. So the U.S. Army itself kind of said, you know, they ended up saying that, well, oh, there's not evidence, Lieutenant Colonel Aquino is cleared. But then Aquino, in his classic litigious way, went and like, I want every single reference to, you know, any kind of investigation against me, blah, 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 and everything like that to be completely like wiped off the record. And I remember in that summary, they said, well, we're not going to do it because some of your, like your alibis were yeah. not corroboratable or convincing. I think of it, they mm-hmm. literally said not convincing. So, you know, even yeah. the army, of course, they're going to cover up for him. And, you know, God knows how deep that goes. But it, it did seem to kind of stop his career. I don't know if he would have gone on. Maybe he's kind of like Jim Channon and some of these other kind of weird men who stare at goats kind of army officers where they would top out at colonel 
But, you know, he also was going to like, you know, all these like national defense colleges and stuff. He was working on, he was, a, you know, a, an attache for NATO in the early 80s, at like the absolute peak of, you know, the Cold War, you know, uh, Star Wars kind of drama going on and was, you know, doing SS dagger rituals in Himmler's castle. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, you so know, so the, and, other, the only yeah. other thing to cover that I'd love for you to cover if you can to kind of wrap up the, and it's it Aquino, is that how we say it? So tie for people back, because this is like, for a lot of us, this is the most super scary part of it is the legitimacy he has inside the military community as a sought after expert, like, oh, don't worry about all of that. He can help us work on this uh, mind control kind of stuff that we're really mm -hmm. interested in. And so grab him, let's use him. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, was like a psyop. He was like the psyop person, you know. He wrote yeah. for like in the recent documentary that HBO put out about QAnon, you know, they highlighted Jean Paul Valley for his, you know, work on psyops, and they were kind of trying to connect him to that. But they glossed over, you know, Aquino's authorship of the Mind War memo for him, this famous white paper that Aquino wrote, which. The concept of mind war, which he would develop later on, you know, mm -hmm. it has to do basically with the idea of sort of convincing your enemy to work with you to fight the mind war against the mutually shared problem. One of the one of my favorite anecdotes about Michael Aquino is that he wrote like an alternate history novel where the Nazis, instead of like committing a genocide, they just use mind war to peacefully win World War II, you know? So it's all about it's like uh, using- called We Break the Sword. Yeah, it's called We Break the Sword. But yeah, yeah he what well, he cut his teeth in Vietnam, you know, doing this very, very spooky operation called uh, Wandering Soul. He developed these recordings known as Ghost Tape Number 10. You can you can listen to online is the, the most famous one, Ghost Tape Number 10. And mm -hmm. basically what they would do is they would play out of helicopters or from backpacks of, of soldiers, these uh, sort of eerie sounds and, and wailings, you know, and the idea was to sort of play off the, and there were many things like this, you know, we talked in our episode on Mothman about the Oswang related uh, psyops that the, took place in the Philippines. At Lansdale, yeah. Yeah, yeah, basically the, the, the idea of this was to sort of suggest and to play off the, what they imagined as being the Vietnamese belief in wandering ghosts and, and spirits and the idea that if you died far away from your homeland that you would be doomed to wander the earth forever. So they would play these spooky whales with this man kind of canting in Vietnamese is about how he died far away from his home and you know give up brothers you know go home it's not too late you know if you die <laughs> fighting the americans you know you will like you know you'll end Be up tortured like in me, hell like, by demons wah, wah, you know uh yeah. just you know moaning apparently you know what what often happened was that people hearing this would just get infuriated and, and return fire but uh, you know and reveal that, their position yeah exactly would often reveal their positions so i guess maybe it was a qualified success isn't that the really yeah. tricky part of it though that that is so yeah. hard to process process is like, how do we really feel about that? You know, because on the first love you go, Oh, my God, he's horrible, this and that. And then you're like, wait a minute, how do I really feel about that in a quote, unquote, war situation as if that was, you know, some kind of war, or some kind of defense, of the United States, or but we could get yeah. into all that. But it's like, we do have this different kind of sensibility that that there are situations where we have to win. And we're going to kind of make that moral a high level decision and then how we implement it, it we really give ourselves a lot of leeway so isn't that really another place where kind of we're struggling with terra firma where the rubber meets the road kind of thing i mean how do don't I mean, we don't we War, want to do I, don't we want to hire alistair crowley to do to see if he can influence the nazis to fly over and we can yeah you know, yeah capture it all yeah. No, I mean, they no. did do that, right? Oh, didn't oh, yeah, he feed oh, him yeah. bad astrological readings or something like that? Like, didn't he feed Hitler's astrologer bad readings or something like that? There, that World is War a, a rumor, but a rumor, yeah, I yeah. mean, they're like, maybe, you know, there's all these myths of like occult circles operating like within the intelligence world in World War II, but... I mean, the Vietnam War, I think Dimitri and I would agree, was not like a moral war to begin with on the part of the United States. So like, and I also feel that yes. these, this is all part of a larger complex, which is very cynical and often, you know, again, like just infuriating and, and insulting to the people who are targeted by it. 
which is to sort of, it has that same sort of sneering. It's very Sam Harris type of sneering thing where it's like, oh, we can manipulate these savages' beliefs. You know, we can, you know, I- invade their their psyches and, and use their, their views against them in, in this way, you know. Yeah, and I mean, oh, also, it, it goes hand in hand with the, the violence of the war. Even uh, to bring yeah. it up to the 80s, to the to Michael Quino's very odd performances on Oprah and the Geraldo show when he went on to, you know, basically defend uh, the temple of set and satanic practices and stuff during the height of the so-called satanic panic you could almost see a parallel between operation wandering soul and what he was doing there because he was going on tv in such a provocative way where it's like he knew what he was doing he knew he was going to basically trigger all of the kind of conservative christian types that were being terrified by what Oprah and Geraldo and all these other people were saying about how there's these evil cults. But then he was also sitting there and going like, that is actually not true. I am, you know, I might have devil eyebrows and have this like, you know, like very witchy wife and stuff and seem very sinister. <laughs> but, you know, actually there's nothing to see here. It almost like it, it in, in the sense of the real goal of the recording of Wandering Soul was to get the, the Viet Cong soldiers to, re- to get angry and reveal their position and expose themselves and it was it was all about eliciting a psychological reaction that was actually not exactly what the kind of ostensible goal of of the operate of the psyop you know the goal was to prey upon their religious superstitions but what it really was more is to get them to show themselves and you know basically rile them up and so much of psyops you can see it today with like with QAnon and all that other stuff there are things that are so tailor-made to almost just like get people fired up and crazy and then react towards something and often it's done in a kind of very sophisticated way where you know i think there were levels to like what michael aquino was doing both in the phoenix program whatever in vietnam and going on you know tv in the 80s trying to defend himself but doing it in this way where it's like look how much of a black magician i am (laughs) you know i think that's totally brilliant and you guys are to be congratulated for kind of seeing that because i remember when you mentioned it and it is such a great insight is that if i can get you to emotionally engage with me and i'm controlling the topic, then I'm mm-hmm. going to win. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, I'm going to drag you into the gutter and we're going to both get dirty. But at the end of the day, we're going to look like equals in some way. And and that just, when yeah, I'm in such this. an adverse position, that uh, adversarial position, that can do nothing but help me. It's mm-hmm. interesting that you mentioned that because that's what his mother would go on to do when she founded or helped to found a KPFA, the radio station, which had yeah, a... I uh, was just going to say yeah, that. Yeah, you know, that very, very similar to their sort of framing where they would always, they would have people of all different beliefs on, but they, it would, they would always end up affirming whatever their views were because they would be setting the questions, you know, so the debate could be about whatever it could have like you know the john birch society it could have like malice you know debating each other but ultimately at the end of the day kpfa would be deciding the terms of the debate and so they would always win the epistemological battle yeah and you know they were committed to a uh, pacifism which of course sounds good but you know it came out of the milieu of like not wanting to fight world war ii so there was definitely <laughs> like a complex element in in that uh, type of pacifism that yeah think, that uh, maybe his mother represented uh, that's that's the other thing thing that that we didn't get we you know we've done further research we have an episode on kpfa hopefully coming out in the next week or so on 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 the patreon feed but we did some deeper diving into that and that was something that really jumped out when i was researching aquino's mom last year is that he claimed that she was instrumental she basically co-founded the pacifica foundation and kpfa radio and i mean are, are you familiar with pacifica radio kpfa kpfk Duh, uh, I'm no. not, but I can only imagine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, have you ever seen Democracy Now? With of course, Amy Goodman. Yeah, that, that's course. that's Pacifica. That's Pacifica Radio, and that's kind of like their flagship. But they were one of the first listener-supported alternative public radio stations. It started in Berkeley in the late 1940s, and then it expanded to Los Angeles and then New York, and it's still around today in kind of various forms. And the seeing that Michael Aquino's mother, because, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area and I remember KPFA is a very granola, hippie, lefty, pacifist kind of radio station. Like it, it's totally identified with like the 60s California kind of sort of counterculture and is definitely situated on the left. 
you know, and, and so that's always what I knew about it kind of growing up. And yeah, if you watch, you know, Democracy Now, oh, they're talking about the Green Party and, you know, they're criticizing the U.S. for doing, you know, bombing people overseas and things like that. But the fact that Aquino's mother was right there at the very beginning of it and like Colin said, was in this milieu of pacifists. Now, the ones that I think of, who is it? Lewis Hill was the main founder. He was the nephew of Frank Phillips, who was uh, an oil baron who, you know, if you know Conoco Phillips, the oil company, or Phillips 66, you know, the gas sure, station. Sure. Yeah, th that's, he's the nephew of that guy. So these guys come from kind of a high bourgeoisie, rob, like Western robber baron kind of backgrounds and stuff. And so I think he met Aquino's mom at Stanford. And then, you know, he was a conscientious objector in World War II. I, I wouldn't say, I, don't, I genuinely think he really did believe in pacifism and like wasn't a secret Nazi sympathizer. But Aquino's mom, on the other hand, she spent the bulk of the 1930s in Nazi Germany and didn't really ever, and nothing we found indicates that she had too many bad things to say about it. And then she has this son who becomes, uh, goes into the military and becomes a PSYOP guy who requests to go to Vietnam and probably loved being involved in the Phoenix program, joins the Church of Satan, the Temple of Set. His mom joined the Temple of Set yeah, after he founded it. Yeah. And, stuff like, and, and so I, it, it really made our head spin of like, how, like, because she was involved, she had a radio show on KPFA for years, like a book report. He claims that she was the first one to introduce the novel, the Boris Basternak novel, Dr. Zhivago, to American audiences after it was translated into English. And, you know, you can go on CIA.gov and see that the whole operation around Dr. Zhivago was like, the CIA was heavily invested in both popularizing it in the West and getting prints of it done in Europe, in Russian, to smuggle back into the Soviet Union. So it was like a Cold War PSYOP. And Aquino says she was the first one to do a review of it, like right when it was published and quote unquote, introduce it to American audiences. So there's that. But then it's like, you know, she's hanging out with all these lefty hippie Bay Area people. And then she didn't she seemed to be totally cool with her son joining the military at the height of the Vietnam War and going like, you know what I mean? Like there's something off there. It doesn't make any sense. Now, of course, KPFA also started getting money from the Ford Foundation. No relation, by the way, Betty Ford. She's not one of those Fords. But the Ford Foundation, I think it went it might have been under the control of McGeorge Bundy. You know, and a bunch, and maybe a Richard Bissell, you know, guys who were involved in Bay of Pigs and, you know, were architects of the Vietnam War itself, were funding this lefty alternative radio station in the Bay Area. And that's something, you know, we've talked about in a lot of different contexts, like the covert funding, like you said, with Gloria Steinem and CIA, like the funding of the counterculture, not like not just the subversion of it, but sometimes creating entities out of whole cloth or you know, basically sponsoring things that are so heavily infiltrated that they end up serving the kind of overall ideological purposes of kind of the the U.S. empire, if you will, in its like kind of Cold War objectives. And oftentimes this is very subtle. You know, it's not like, you know, they did have John Birch Society people and Maoists and sometimes communists on, but they're you know, the, the way it was framed was in such a way that I assume if it was really politically or epistemologically threatening to the U.S. ruling class, and the Ford Foundation wouldn't have given it millions of dollars. You know, I mean, is that Generally a safe not. assumption? Yeah, they also <laughs> funded uh, Kenneth Anger, a uh, satanic yeah. dabbler. But yeah, and you know, people sometimes will say like, oh, you know, what is the significance of doing genealogy? You know, everyone has like a, a suspicious family. I mean, Aquino himself is suspicious, so you don't really even need to go to his family. But you know, it does bear mentioning that he would characterize himself, you know, in these terms. I remember one of my uh, favorite things that he's he said that uh, someone else pointed out to us was that he described himself as being born with you know a whirl of a swastika of hair on his chest you know and his eyebrows oh my God. naturally tilted up <laughs> in this satanic way you know and he, I, I incidentally i was born you know only nine months after a certain ritual was performed you know by That's jack right, Parsons. Yeah. you know yeah he basically uh, depicted himself as being like the, a moon child produced by like the babylon working or, or sort of uh -huh. antichrist 
ritual. So, you know, the idea of uh, implicating his mother in all of this is something that originates with him, you know. Yes. Uh, not, and not also, with. just to throw in, we also found, I think, in an interview, you know, it was kind of not a lot about her religion or, you know, what kind of church or faith she belonged to, except for, of course, that she joined the Temple of Set in the 70s. But before that, he did mention that when she ran off and kind of got married to Aquino's, you know, putative father, Michael Aquino Sr., right at the end of, I, I think right at the end of World War II, that mm. they needed to find a church to go get married in. And she didn't belong to a church, which I think in early 20th century America is interesting in and of itself. But then yeah. she finally picked a Swedenborgian church because its doctrines were the least uh, repulsive to her. Yeah, and so, has, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm mm -hmm. still looking more into Swedenborgian stuff, but that yeah, is some real very woo -woo. sus history and a huge uh -huh. Freemasonic connection to the history mm -hmm. of Swedenborganism. So, yeah, that is, that is that stuck out to me as an interesting choice when you mentioned it way back when. And I think that might not have been on, just random. Him. Yeah, like, definitely. I think maybe she was a Swedenborgian, maybe, yeah, or her something, dad was. You know, or at least had an affinity with them, and they have an affinity, you know, the, of those doctrines they have. Like, you know, that Swedenborgianism came out originally out of sort of like a Freemasonic milieu, or was very connected with the revival of, of Freemasonry. But yeah, it is. It's very, it's very, it's very interesting connection. <laughs> but there's one topic I really wanted to dive into. There's like multiple, multiple connections with the work that you've done. Again, check out Subliminal Jihad, and you're kind of getting a sense for how these guys go at it and the connections that they'll link that you, you never knew were there. And you know, what, what was that? S the swastika on my the, chest. Yeah, I mean the world. <laughs> yeah, he said that the Buddha and also uh, I think Crowley had it. The, the swastika, the world swastika uh, of hair on his uh, chest. Uh, yeah. Um, but the topic, I, the topic I want to try and wade into and we won't really have time to cover it hardly at all but is the ufo et thing and mm -hmm. maybe one way to get there is danny sheehan because yeah. i just interviewed ralph blumenthal who wrote a book autobiography of john mack you guys know who john mack is right yeah yeah, yeah i listened to a little bit Harvard. Harvard. yeah Europe i remember reading his him. book way way back in high school yeah because he was mm -hmm. the preeminent like you know abduction guy if you know had the credentials you know the series yeah. exactly guy, yeah he's the guy who had mm -hmm. the credentials so you know th th there there had been this thing where abduction was all in the air and uh, bud hopkins and david jacobs mm -hmm. are really the guy who are making guys who are making all the noise about abduction and then john mack who is superstar harvard psychiatrist i mean like elite elite pulitzer prize winner he, he, but thinks he can do anything so he just kind of is rubbing shoulders with Bud Hopkins because he's art connection. Khalid, he's mm -hmm. kind of an esteemed artist in Manhattan, Bud Hopkins mm -hmm. is. So he's like, hey, yeah. let's go see what this guy's up to. I think it's all bullshit. But then he becomes, oh my God, if this is real, I have to know. And I'm John Mack, I can know anything. And he starts interviewing people and he says, this is real. He says, as all my training as a psychiatrist leads me to believe that this is real. They're not hallucinating and, and that's what i'm trained to do that's what i do i tell if people are having hallucinations or delusions or anything like that mm -hmm. they're people it's not cultural there's i have a two-year-old that says uh, she saw the thing come in the room this and that i have people who are paraplegic who can't move who have marks on their body he goes everything my training and my common sense tells me that these accounts are real, right? So that is who John Mack is. And he gets in all sorts of trouble at Harvard, which again, he's kind of a naive guy, which is surprising, but he kind of has this, you know, he's kind of a rich kid, a trust fund, Jewish elitist East Coast kind of, and he's kind of naive and he just thinks, oh, well, this will be great. And then Harvard is gonna sack him, you know, and they call him in for this kind of, inquisition kind of thing and he's stumbles out of it and he doesn't know what he does he doesn't know what to do and he's like calling up whitley streber and he goes hey man i think this is over you know i could lose everything and who comes to the rescue danny sheehan danny yeah. sheehan comes and he represents him danny sheehan along with who you guys you know always say danny sheehan jesuit because <laughs> he does yeah, have right. the, the Jesuit yeah, right, right. The Christic yeah. Institute was his yes. thing that he founded. Yes. 
Uh, but he his... was originally like doing Iran Contra defense, you know, defending Iran Contra ac accusers, whistleblowers. But he kind of blew it up by getting mired in like Larushi stuff, you know. Uh -huh. And you guys time, have an you, know? you guys have an incredible show on that that I I I can't quite process that all the way. Like I don't know because that could flip either way. And Chien shows up in a bunch of other different places. But it is interesting. Mm -hmm. And I actually asked, you know. Ralph Blumenthal, the guy who wrote the book, and he's a veteran New York Times journalist. But there's another quick story I want to say about Blumenthal. But back to back to Mac for a minute. His co-attorney on this is the guy from uh, Spotlight, the guy who I forget his name now, but the guy who defended Roderick uh, Roderick McLeish. Is he the guy who prosecuted the priests in Boston? Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. So, so that's what a strange mix there to have to have yeah, uh, well, she... do you want i don't know i don't know if you're aware of this do you want to do you want it to get even weirder because i'm reading right now that he was supported john mack was financially or his nonprofit was supported for four years at a cost of two hundred fifty thousand dollars per year by the reincarnated emperor of atlantis lawrence rockefeller <laughs> right yeah that makes sense yeah he was told i guess during allegedly we've heard that he was told at esalen institute by the nine the sort of famous yes. channeled entities who ran Esalen for a while, you know, that he was a reincarnation of an emperor of Atlantis. So that's why we refer to Nelson Rockefeller by, yes. by that title. <laughs> but it, yeah, it, it's, you know, this is it's something that's very interesting to me, you know, not to, I know I haven't listened to your show with Louis Strieber, but I'm interested to do so. But it's something that was very interesting to me and in sort of reading more about him because of the connection that Jimmy drew between him and Jack Sarfati and Epstein that hadn't necessarily occurred to me before. You know, his work goes in very interesting directions. You know, the idea of the connection between the aliens and the dead, you know, of course, there's this gifted children theme where there's, you know, from childhood, you know, there's this connection with them that then blossoms in later life. And uh, something that he brought out in later works is that, you know, the there's some connection between them and, and death, you know, that we're being brought up for death. I guess it's connected in a way with the NDA thing and some of the skepticism. It connects yeah. only with the skeptical part. And that's why I think we need to be suspicious of it because it has. So I don't know, I, I, we can't decide definitively, but it, it has a lot of the fingerprints of a of a psyop too, you know, is that I am going to yeah, well, co-op that and I'm going to kind of control I that guess there's message. there's two narratives of it. One is that like it's all an alien trick and the other one is that the aliens are like real sincere peaceful representatives of, you know, whatever awaits us upon death. You know, there's different spins on it. I wouldn't necessarily break it down like that because I, I would say, look, as soon as we contemplate an extraterrestrial non-human intelligence in these extended realms, well, we can attach anything to it. We can say, you know, they're in cahoots with the military industrial complex and, you know, they're yeah. doing this or that it's my lab or that it's Space Brothers mm -hmm. or that they came and met with Eisenhower and they gave him a choice. Do you want to be the good right. aliens or the yeah, bad yeah, aliens? Yeah. And he uh -huh. chose, you can go to, so again, where's terra firma, you know? And so to me, John Mack is is partly terra firma, you know? It's not like if, if and, th and that was the interesting conversation I had with Blumenthal, right? So like, if you wanna step over John Mack's work, you can do that. But then what you enter into is that, okay, our reality that we're talking to on this little Zoom call is a non-reality. So we are talking from a, a prejudicially uh, stupider non-reality contemplating the greater reality because there's no other way to process what what John Mack is saying because John Mack uh, after a while he kind of comes around to the idea of kind of a Jacques Vallée-ish kind of mm -hmm. yeah. hey maybe I don't see the full picture yeah and you know the, yeah, other thing, I always, the right. thing I always bring up about Jacques Vallée is that because I interviewed Jacques Vallée you know Jacques Vallée says those things but they are misinterpreted by most people and I actually asked mm, him this in his yeah. interview it's not a it's not an either and it's a both thing and it's a guy who right. still walks around with a piece of slag in his pocket from a quote-unquote alien spaceship that when you look at it under uh, an electron microscope has characteristics that we are unable to create or engineer on this planet. So, and if you go, you know, not to kind of do the whole, but the, the other person I interviewed that I think, I always think is like a forgotten piece of this is like this woman from Montana State University, an anthropologist, her name is Dr. Artie Sixcolor Clark, Native American scholar, but she went and interviewed all these 
Native Americans, and then she started interviewing indigenous people around the world. And they're like, yeah, star people. They come from the stars. We've known it all along. Here's what it is. And they even have contemporary uh, encounters with them, but they also have all these ones from their tradition and stuff like that. So again, to step over that data and say, oh, well, you know, we now understand or we now are contemplating this extended realm where Aquino is doing dissociative identity disorder and connecting with evil spirits. So wrap it up. There it is. There's ET. It's like, fuck, no, don't look that way to me. It looks like ET is definitely in play and all the rest of that stuff is in play. And if anything, we're just sitting over here in our tiny little confine of this brain that's processing this consciousness that's flowing through us. And we're looking through the pinhole. Mm -hmm. So you're yeah. saying basically that you do think that they come from that there's aliens from another planet uh, in outer space. I mean, best I evidence, best evidence gets you there. The I best evidence is going to be cross culture, cross time. You go cross culture, mm -hmm. cross time. It's it's all over the place. Uh, they they you go to the Dogen. They don't even in in Africa, yeah. an ancient tribe. Yeah. They don't even have a language. They say, yeah, there it is, Pallades. And by the way, you know, for the last hundreds of years, they've told us there's a twin star there. And not until you know twenty years later, when we have the micro, when we have the telescope capability, after the first anthropologist gets there, they look and go, oh my God, there is a twin star there. You know, what I mean, it's mm -hmm. yeah. confirming. Yeah, not necessarily yeah. discount the importance of space or the you know the importance of the sky or the stars, the astronomical or astrological phenomena and the connection to this. I think that definitely, obviously, yes, you're absolutely right that culturally speaking, there's an association between the, you know these beings in the sky. So I think that that is definitely salient, and you know, I think that space, traditionally speaking, is imagined you know as you know, we're talking about another realm, you know, like you said, both and, you know, space traditionally isn't imagined as like an extension of our same plane, you know, where there's an atmosphere and then you go out into outer space. We're talking about traditional imagination that usually it is like a different ontological domain, like the firmament, you know, where the stars are. That's not mm -hmm. like just an extension of the same sort of physical rules or the same physical framework that we have on Earth, you know, by just by virtue of like an atmospheric screen. You know, it's a different like in the same way, you know, that's where like angels and things like that live, uh -huh. you know, so it, yeah, I think Demons definitely and principalities. there's, yeah, exactly, powers of the powers of the air, right, yeah, so I think that there definitely is some, some significance to that, but, you know, I definitely don't, I don't think it, from, from what I gather, I don't think that it, it means you, you would either, and saying both, and I definitely think that there's more than just that there's, you know, a, a normal race of intelligent beings that, you know, came here in spaceships, I think that there's something, yeah, there's something going on with other the ontological domains of, of reality you know there's a connection between this and you know the idea of of the jinn for instance uh, between mm -hmm. you know shadow people or, or other types of other categories of spirit spirit being uh, also the technology which now i'm seeing that the navy the pentagon just keeps releasing these videos of course they could always be cgi but i'm willing to accept that the videos are showing something like we can finally put that to rest that ufos are not just there's definitely a ufo balloons phenomenon that people misinterpreted. yeah there's definitely a ufo phenomenon and an abduction phenomenon definitely like mm -hmm. there's not it's not just like people like you know farmers like out in the sticks like lying or something or people just seeing like balloons and being confused like they're mm -hmm. both genuine things and that's always really been acknowledged i think they're, these are real phenomena the question is you know what's the explanation behind them I mean, to your earlier, your much earlier point at the very top of the show, I think that I am skeptical of the hard push toward the kind of materialistic ET phenomenon from two angles, you know, one being that they're peaceful and one being that they're a military threat. I think that that's like a huge reduction of the actual situation as, you know, encountered by people who have dealt with it extensively the, pin, that, the pincer yeah, movement yeah. as you guys called yes. it i thought was beautiful yes. Mm -hmm. yes, exactly. <laughs> well yeah i mean yeah between stephen greer and the to the stars academy there is a weird kind of dialectic going on where mm -hmm. they're kind of beefing it almost feels in a kind of like a pro wrestling kind of way of the, these are the two poles of the ufo disclosure community and they're both saying the other one is psyoping you but they're probably both psyoping you to a certain degree i mean when you just look at who 
these people are associated with, like, yeah. you know, people from the Mellon family and Pentagon people and John Podesta. Give me a break. Tell that story real quick in the way that you guys do it. So you got Stephen Greer up there saying, hey, they're all good. And the only bad mm-hmm. ones are the evil my lab stay away from them. And then I love the way you, so many people don't see this. And you guys were like totally on it. You know, he's he's up there with the uh, with Dodie. He's up there with yeah. Dodie. Yeah. He's yeah. up there with yeah. Dodie. It's like, on, how, how, yeah. how, how can we even, how can we even process that as anything other? Than, it's an in, it's almost like in your face, psyoping, yeah. you know, mind controlling you. And, and, and he comes out of transcendental meditation. Stephen yeah. Greer. Well, that's what he yeah. pushes as a way to uh, engage with these things. So that's, yeah, that's another interesting component of it because he does have this kind of, yeah, maybe they're in a higher spiritual plane, but he still like deals in the same tropes of like the saucer men, you know, they come, you know, maybe they're, they're light beings in some way, but they, you know, they've been, they're in contact with the military, you know, they come from other planets, et cetera, you know, and I think that there definitely is. I do not credit or trust like the people who are trotted out, you know, on Tucker or, you know, in the media to be the ambassadors for how this phenomenon is going to be interpreted. Because, yeah, you're absolutely right that those who have followed this for a while, like it is quite transparent to them. But I think that there's a huge increase in awareness of this, like in the general population where there's a huge push like the New York Times, et cetera. Like yeah. their people are becoming more aware and like they're just believing what these ambassadors of the subject are saying. And I do not trust like you know, either narrative. And I think that, yeah, it is a pincer move where they're meant to be like in dialectic and by the appearance of conflict, it's to exclude like all the things that are important to consider about this. Like everything that they agree on is like the area where you need to be worried. Like, you know, the fight they're having is trivial, like their area of agreement that's like where the psyop, I think, comes in. Yeah. It's back to Michael Aquino, right? I mean, yeah, as you guys yeah. are saying, it's like, hey, and he was me... into you. He was a space intelligence officer in the early 90s at the end of yeah, his true. career. And on, on certain interviews, he would talk very coyly about having been to Area 51 and that maybe he had seen certain technologies that may or may not have had ET origins. But remember, mm-hmm. he said something weird about a, like a gyroscope device that he once held in his hand that I guess... I think he was implying it mimicked the kind of properties of how a UFO would move, like a flying saucer. I think that deep down, you know, maybe not, he didn't publicize it as heavily uh, as maybe some other people do, but I think that he really did also have kind of a both and approach to this phenomenon in a similar Jack Vallee way. Like he thought that he did believe like in kind of ancient aliens type stuff. I think that he had an idea of set and maybe some of these like other Lovecraftian entities that he would mention as being, you know, out there in some way, a connection between you know, the whole binary of the material and spiritual is a bit vain, you know, or or at least a bit porous, where, you know, I think that it's not just like, oh, you know, they're evil spirits, but they're, they're you know, they're separate from our reality. No, they're like a part of it. The whole thing of like supernatural and paranormal, that is in a way like, if not a psyop, then like a naive distinction, because like these things are part of nature. Let me throw a a tiny little log on the fire that you guys can spin off of and it totally complements what you're already talking about but you know i was mentioning ralph blumenthal the guy wrote the john mack biography and you know the other thing he's famous for (laughs) i talked about this is he along with leslie kane who is awesome and i've interviewed her a couple times on the show they're the ones who broke the new york times december 2017 a tip you know the flying they're the people so and i always was like to me it was always such an obvious political psyop it was like come on you're kidding me and and the tell is that then they get you you know you push them they go well it wasn't classified okay this is this is (laughs) the biggest story the biggest event in history bubbling pentagon once again yeah yeah, right right yeah for 50 60 years we've been threatening how many people we know beyond threatened how many people have probably been killed over this families have been threatened you know have you ever let any of this information out oh it was just laying there was unclassified but i genuinely think that blumenthal and leslie kane are, are are sincere you know when you talk to them because and in a way, I love that, and it's a kind of a topic I don't know if we'll have time to get into, but it's like understanding the complexity of all our lives and how you can be all these things and how we can all be duped, you know, and how we can all be how we can all be duped and we think we're getting a real story and they're making us fight for it, you know, and it's like, yeah. oh gosh, we got it. Oh, we got it, we got it. And all the way, all along, they were playing you, you know, and that video 
And I interviewed the guy who was on the boat, very, very key a witness and all his experiences with it. He said, th that's the real video. It was in my secret inbox the next day, but it also showed up on the internet seven years ago. Somebody released it and got out. So I, the video is, is no doubt, in my opinion, real. But the fact that these guys got duped by the New York Times into thinking that this was something other than the other arm of the pincer movement, you know, mm -hmm. come exactly. on. And, and yeah, and then you look at the people like I mentioned, like Lawrence Rockefeller spent millions of dollars. I guess he founded, he he financed MUFON, the, let me see, FUFOR, like all of these different groups for many, many years. And then when you think about somebody like John Podesta, who's such an operator, who is kind of aligned, it almost, it may even map onto the kind of Republican Democrat kind of dialectic in yeah. the sense of yeah. like, you got Harry Reid, John Podesta, Tom DeLonge, like a kind of Hollywood entertainment guy on one and then like the melons on one side, though, honestly, they're they're both right and left wing, depending on the day. And then on the other side, you have Tucker, who interestingly, I don't know if this is totally irrelevant. It's interesting that he's such a deadhead and is also yeah. doing these like UFO reports mm -hmm. and is also probably CIA. His dad, I believe, ran either Voice of America or the Broadcasting Board of Governors in the 1980s at like the absolute climax of the Cold War and the collapse of you know, communism around the world. Like that was his, his dad. His dad runs around with like sketchy commando military contractors in the Middle East and stuff. Tucker, I believe, sorry, I, I believe Tucker, didn't he say, isn't he one of these many people in the media who said they like tried to apply for the CIA but got rejected? I don't believe that, honestly. And I hadn't uh, heard so that. It's, it's interesting. So it's, he's kind of more, you know, we, we've talked about the Yankee and cowboy dialectic a lot lately. Tucker kind of comes from, I, I guess, kind of, the despite his you know his love for bow ties in the past kind of a more cowboy aligned sort of thing so maybe he's going to be having more of the stephen greer type I, though i don't know maybe it doesn't well, map he, neatly he boosted the elizondo type of like he boosted the phenomenon in the show i remember very clearly oh, okay, that when okay. he had uh i think it was elizondo that he had in his show but whoever he had on he uh, did he did have yeah me. Yeah, he said something that was like, if it weren't an election year, you know, or an election month, yes. we would do a whole week on this. It's uh -huh. that important, which is such yeah. an amazing, you know, especially for like an audience like Tucker's, which is generally very uncritical and, you know, just hanging on his every word for like all their views about the world. Like that's quite a profound statement. Like, yeah, you use hyperbole all the time, but like that's going to activate like people's sensibilities about this. But yes, it's it's very bizarre and something that, you know, the whole thing, I feel like the most famous or one of the most famous uh, things to, or, or UFOs to come out of this is Tic Tac. You know, the idea of the Tic Tac, something that is like, okay, so what is the space narrative? You know, there definitely has to be some more complexity to it because did the aliens just invent the Tic Tac? Like what happened to the old saucers? You know, they stopped using those. They have now the Tic Tacs. They're like, and how convenient is it that this now looks like the case for your like Apple ear pods or whatever, you know, that they're flying <laughs> around in. Like it looks like something mm -hmm. that, you know, Apple would design if they were going to design like a UFO. Like, why? Why is this the case? You know, it's it's very interesting. You know, yeah. I mean, I uh, Jack Vallee was involved in that phenomenon documentary, and I definitely understand the critique of Jack Vallee that you hear from some quarters. And he is like a spooked up person, and he has these things. But I do, I don't understand. Uh, yeah. I don't understand the yeah. haters. I don't understand yeah. the haters on no, Vallee. I, I, I really don't. I think he's. I think he's as legit as as I can find. And I think he has that that French vibe that adds to his legitimacy to a certain extent. Yes. He goes, I really don't give a shit about what you <laughs> Americans think I'm going to go back to the sanity sanity of, uh, of France. But he's also you know, he's plugged into I think he's legitimate venture capitalist, not like a phony venture capitalist that gets put on boards. He really has some knowledge. He's a computer scientist, you know, and I'm a computer yeah. scientist. So I, I respect that he I don't know. I, I don't understand the haters yeah, well, there. And, and you know, the story, point. the story that yeah. he told me on, on the show that I thought was really great. And it's confirming of something else that you guys can clue into. He said he was there at SRI when they were doing the Project Stargate stuff at the beginning, you know, before they get into the remote viewing, or I guess at the same time, but they had Uri Geller famously there, you know, the nine guy from the nine who Andre, which we could go yeah. off, but we're yeah. not going to go there. But anyways, he's there. And he had missed the experiment, the testing that he done. So he says, Yuri says, here, we'll do it. We'll do it right here. And so this is the words of Jacques Vallée. He says, I did a protocol where I came up with this 
image in my head and then Jacques Vallée or I wrote it down or whatever it was. But it was really quite amazing and I'm botching it because I can't remember it off the top of my head. But it was actually had a language part of it that combined two images in a way that you wouldn't normally do. It was just kind of a quirky thing that Valet had, had done almost inadvertently that would have probably not flown in the protocol of the experiment, but made it more difficult. But Geller was able to totally, you know, get it and say, read his mind, essentially. And he was also able to, you know, bend spoons right in front of him and spoons that were at the table in the cafeteria. And he was able to stop a watch and all that stuff that sounds really, really hokey and really, really suspicious. I mean, yeah. he doesn't well, have a reason to lie on that and tell those stories. Well, and he says, oh, I, I was mean, there. yeah, we know I we just tend to hedge like when we're talking about these things. But really what I was my larger point was that I really admire his uh, passport to Magonia. And I, I admire the take that he and, and John Keel have on this phenomenon where, you know, you can see the, for instance, in the airship rumors you know, in the 19th century United States around like the, you know, mysterious inventor who had built this airship that was cited by so many people or even the medieval accounts of like a big hook coming out of some airborne craft and like, you know, lassoing off to someone like the transformations in the way these crafts are seen based on you know what people uh imagine about them or, or ha their expectations that they have and all the different weird absurdities or, or contradictions around the phenomenon you know i think that's a very mm -hmm. salient and important point like when talking about this stuff you know i think that something that the stephen greer and the Toy Stars Academy approaches both have in common is that they're very reductive. They're very narrow in their approach. You know, they want us to, you know, they do want to have Great a sort point. of nailing it down, you know, and for things to be like, oh, you know, they, all the aliens look like this, you know, they, these are the craft that they fly, et cetera. Yep. You know, and it's just yeah, like, exactly. yeah. Yeah. They want to bottle it all up. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I, I think it's the, I think it's the closest, even though, I can't say 100% would trust Jacques Vallée, but that's more has to do with the people he was associated with from put off to Targ to who was it, Kit Green, the CIA analyst to Ira yeah. Einhorn and somebody else who got the God phone call, you know, yeah. very weird case there. Edgar Mitchell, who I think founded uh, the Institute for Noetic what's Science. The, what's the dirt on Edgar Mitchell? I wasn't aware. Was he a God no, phone Edgar, guy? Edgar Mitchell wasn't, but he, he got very into parapsychology after he had some kind of mystical experience, right, I right. believe, coming back from the moon. Right. And he, I believe, yeah, he co founded the Institute for Noetic Sciences. He was also, I actually didn't know this, he was he was a member of De Molay International, a Mason, international Masonic fraternity, and was active in the Boy Scouts as a teenager, and <laughs> received a private pilot license at 16, which means he might have been in Civil Air Patrol. No, uh, don't go there. <laughs> don't go there. We're at two hours. I wanted oh, to go. No. I wanted um, to go. Lee, yeah, Harvey, he up, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. I wanted he grew to go. Up near Roswell, New Mexico also. And and, oh, yeah, yeah, I knew that. Uh, yeah, so I mean, but yeah, the Institute for Noetic Sciences was, I want to say that, wow, actually, I, I, there's so much stuff with him. In 1976, he attempted to secure additional funding for SRI's remote viewing research in a private meeting with Director of Central Intelligence, George H.W. Bush. So uh, and I guess they knew he, they had the good relationship, but where I, I can't remember if Institute of Noetic Sciences. Well, OK, so they they were one of the people that were involved with the SRI report that we just did an episode on called Changing Images of Man. Yeah, that's something. Yeah, I wanted to bring up this whole time because it's, it's yeah, very relevant. Yeah, yeah to that type mm -hmm. of, you know, 60s stuff with the like, you know, when you mentioned like they're engaged with remote viewing and all of these things like an SRI in particular, like, yeah, it's uh, very, very relevant. I I think yeah yeah, yeah they cool. mention all kinds of things from yeah, yeah esp to remote viewing to hypnosis and things like that and mm -hmm. uh, in that and it, it feels very prophetic in that basically they're kind of talking about social engineering using a kind of new agey paradigm that was very big in Stanford and Palo Alto and kind of California in general among this kind of academic and scientific intelligentsia at the time and a lot of it does seem to have come curiously kind of true often kind of via the internet, which is also what SRI was building at the exact same time. And that's, I don't know if you have any uh, particular take on that, the kind of duality of 
because I do think it's very interesting that they were doing all these experiments in ESP, remote viewing, telekinesis, whatnot, and kind of like, you know, wireless information transfer, you know, brain to brain, if you will. But then they're simultaneously building the infrastructure and the technology and even like the, you know, the conceptual framework for what would be like computer technology and the internet. And in a way, if you look at like satellite GPS technology or smartphones, all these things, are these not kind of like substitute prosthetic like uh, cyborg devices that are meant to do the things that were being covered in these remote viewing and parapsychology experiments? And if so, I know there there's a take that I'm familiar with that I'm not sure that I am fully on board with because I think there's there's some kind of there there with the parapsychology stuff. But to some extent, was some of that stuff a smokescreen perhaps or certain aspects of it for the actual building of the internet? Because, okay, just for example, remote viewing, they were using that in the 1980s, people like Ingo Swan, right? To go spy on, say, a Soviet nuclear facility, right? And, you know, they, they, they would use it for espionage purposes. But then there are other things that could do the exact same thing, at least to my knowledge, when you were talking about like the, I don't know, the, the types of remote viewing they would at least be doing in these military applications. Maybe there was a story about they walked into like Brezhnev's office in the Kremlin once. That but was one the... of the, uh, yeah, one of the, in the Soviet Psychic Discoveries book that we read. That was one, I forget uh -huh. the name of the the performer, but he was one of the a great sort of magician and illusionist. You know? Oh, you mean Wolf Messing? Yeah, yeah Wolf Messing. One yeah. thing that was kind of significant is like once they had the kind of i think what was it called echelon like the secret spy satellite yes. network that was really up and running by the 80s they were able to monitor soviet economic activity in real time in a way that they never were able to do before and because of this, so for example like take grain for example if you could have satellites flying over there 24 7 and you could predict the size of the grain harvest or, you know, where, how fast it moved to market, the transportation lines, all that kind of stuff that you were kind of boxed out on before. Like it was really hard to get intelligence on that. If you could get enough detail, then you could start manipulating global commodities markets, which they did, you know, under the, the leadership of people like Bill Casey, the CIA director, as part of this vaster strategy to economically basically sabotage the Eastern Bloc and basically throw it into crisis by manipulating everything from like the global oil prices to like the price of grain and all kinds of other things. So in a way, the that satellite technology would be an incredibly valuable weapon to disrupt their economy. Now, if they knew that we had those satellites, I mean, I don't know if they could have, you know, done anything about it, but if they knew that we had those satellites, you know, maybe they could, you know, plan accordingly and try to counteract that. But if all they hear is that we have a bunch of psychic super spies that are remote viewing on them, which is what they were hearing because the Esalen had the Soviet American friendship organization. Oh my God. That you was gotta, sending scientists I, back. There's too, there's too many threads here, but you do have to, before <laughs> you leave, the Gorby Yeltsin dropping acid thing yes. is so yeah. freaking because it's another one of those where now I don't know how I feel about that. Now I feel like, damn, way to go, guys. You know, I mean, <laughs> tell that tell that story real quick. Well, I, well, yeah, I mean that that that's a sort of we don't know that for sure, but we do know that it's both almost or, certain to me. It's almost certain that it's some kind of drug. I don't know if it was. I think acid. To, at, at least to Yeltsin, at least to yeah. Yeltsin, because Yeltsin came over here in the kind of uh, mid to late 1980s when he was still, you know, a politician, a Soviet politician, and he's, you know, that he went, he came over here on Esalen sponsored tour of America, and you know, he's mentioned a few things of it over the years that you can find some quotes from him, and apparently. Apparently, this is where he had his ecstatic conversion to capitalism was in Houston supermarket on this tour by Esalen, where he looked around at just all the colorful cereal boxes and Twinkies and yeah. Coca-Cola. <laughs> sure and he like yeah. burst into tears because it was so glorious. And like his poor, poor Russian Soviet people just have to eat, I don't know, organic food in jars that isn't poison. <laughs> it's so terrible, right? You know, or blah, 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 bread lines, et cetera. But you know, that was like his story of like, oh, I just realized the abundance of American capitalism and wanted to, and then I was resolved to like go 
back and like bring capitalism back to Russia, you know? And so there's that. But then, you know, he went on a whole tour and I'm pretty sure he stopped at Esalen where they got those those hot spring tubs and everything. And it could have been at any point on that trip where somebody could have either slipped him something or, you know, I mean, that guy was already a pretty big alcoholic. So, you know, just drop something in his vodka and boom, there you go. So I don't we don't know what could have, I mean, he like as a kind of bumbling alcoholic uh, piece of shit that he was, he was probably relatively easy to manipulate or something. But at the same time, I think Gorbachev actually is a more interesting case because I feel like up to a point, Gorbachev really believed in kind of what he was doing with Glasnost and Perestroika. Like he, right. he did consider himself a, a good socialist or a communist, but he just, he felt that it had to be reformed and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we, he had to do a dangus turn basically. And and then also save the world from, I think mean, he, he was very mindful and afraid of like nuclear annihilation and that, that stuff, which is, again, was a psyop that was deliberately fostered by the Reagan administration. So I think there was a lot like, you know, of, of factors like that going in but you know i i would ugh, i i'd like i have to dig deeper into that yeah but i don't know my Did, bet i don't know if that, gorby yeah, himself I, visited slln but if he did like well if you think about it like that's what those human potential movement i mean if you read changing images of man like they're obsessed with right. it like they really truly genuinely believe and like especially like if you go back and like make the mk ultra connection like they believe in using psychedelics to like change people's perceptions and like save the world mm -hmm. from you know disaster like they Definitely. Yeah, I agree with you. Definitely at least Yeltsin. Like that rumor, I, I definitely believe it. Like, yeah. I don't know if Gorby like on the books went to Esalen, but like every every Soviet like advisor of his who went there, like for sure. Uh, you know, yeah, I, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, what they did is they they somehow like it ended up being a kind of coup from the inside where the ideological but, like hot of the party. tub diplomacy at the time. Yeah, they hot were, like, tub they would always tout it. Yeah, because they yeah, yeah. exactly. They so, you know, it could have been they sat in the hot tub and said, look, Boris, we think that you are just the person that Russia needs but you know you need to go back and do this for us and we'll make you president of russia or something like that i mean i know somebody was slipping in the late 80s like maybe the kgb was slipping because you know how do you let this guy like run around with esalen in america and then come back and obviously be somebody who's trying to undermine the socialist system that people voted to maintain and then does it anyways and like nobody gets him like i don't know it's it's very kind yeah. of weird let me throw out a little bit of time we have left and we keep going over, but I can't stop talking to you guys. Let me throw out one other little trail that I've run across that will directly, maybe we'll, you'll, you'll have to track it down and see what you think. Grant Cameron is a UFO researcher and he's from Canada. And then the late great Dan Friedman is another guy who was yeah. kind of pretty, pretty well renowned as being a UFO investigator who was legit and, you know, did really good solid work. Well, between them, they managed to pry loose a FOIA request, and it's something called something differently called in Canada. But the Wilbert Smith memo, have you ever heard of that? Yes, I don't think yes. so. So, uh, Wilbert Smith was the guy in Canada at the strange desk in Canada for all aerial phenomena. So right. he's getting these UFO reports, and finally he goes to the, his bosses of bosses and says, what are we going to do? And they go, right, go down there, go down to the States, see what's going on. He goes down, he meets with Vandevar Bush, he meets with all the people that, that he says in this memo that he writes when he comes back, that you would only... We only know later that these are the people, these are the Majestic 12, if you believe in Majestic 12, and I think there's a kernel of truth there. But this, and again, this memo is only released accidentally, and, and it does look like it truly was released accidentally, unlike the phony ones, that are fake ones that are released accidentally. But the yeah. memo says this, the memo says this, it says, yes, UFOs are real, it is the at the highest level of security inside the United States, higher than the hydrogen bomb. But here's the point that Cameron, Grant Cameron, you've got to give him credit for picking out. In the last line of it, it says, they believe that there is a mental phenomenon associated with this, and they are exploring that. And what he connects that to is MKUltra. So, and, it, it, and it doesn't, like we're saying, it's not an either or thing. It's not like spy on the Russians, get the, you know, or they're spying on us, do it before they do. But it's also that 
ET is in this other realm where telepathy is the mode of communication. We don't know shit about telepathy. We better yeah. start getting up to speed on some of these extended mental realms. And I, it just, yeah, it looks yeah. worth pursuing to me. Well, it, it does. Actually, that reminds me like my, I think the take I lean towards most with that kind of stuff about you know, was remote viewing a cover for like internet technology being created is I kind of lean more towards both and of because I don't know, from everything I've read about all this parapsychological phenomenon, like two things jump out. One is that there seems to be a demonstrable kind of effect. Like I it, it does seem like there is something like some people have a certain kind of enhanced ability. At the same time, it seems to be pretty clear that it's very difficult to like programatize and system and standardize it and also like mass produce it in a way that you can privatize it and integrate it into like our corporate economy and roll it out to everybody and use it to control everybody because it's too not well understood enough yet. So basically it's like they were kind of pursuing these two tracks and maybe they had to build the internet because it, it, it's kind of like that thing with Tesla, how Tesla invented like wireless energy. And then, right. you know, JP Morgan was like, well, I can't meter for this. Like, right. that sucks. I'm going to go with Edison. It's kind of like that. It's like, well, you couldn't fully control if we just started opening like remote viewing schools and like teaching people how to cultivate their psychic abilities or something like that. Well, where's the money and control in that? You right. know, instead, let's put these satellites up and then convince everybody to buy this phone and get people in sweatshops to make the phone and use child slaves in Africa to mine the minerals for it and then put it all together and then blast psyops at you 24 seven and like, you know, basically create a little cathexis device that addicts you and then we can and then we can get our claws in them real good. And then, you know, they probably won't even and then we can still pursue our parapsychological stuff and and i'm sure somebody is still trying to figure out kind of how to reliably do it in a way where you know anybody with the the money or the access could you know pick up a skill but, but maybe not maybe it doesn't work that way maybe well, some people have it some people don't like we we don't yeah, really know i so, think there's yeah. this has always been a thing where there's a certain sense of its unreliability i think that you know the to try to use i think that's spiritual powers like in the way they've been discussed like traditionally you know yeah it's very difficult to use these for a uh, cynical or, or selfish motives but i do think that you know not to go completely down the both end rabbit hole but part of what you're saying is i think or uh, to speak to what you're saying in part is that I think there isn't necessarily a divide between these things because like, again, as we all talked about on the show, some of the like technologies like that we use now, like really have like an archeology span or a history to them that is connected to like these occult practices, like the scrying glass, you know, the black, the obsidian black mirror right. and the mm. black mirror of the yeah. uh, computer screen, the you know, I think ball. that they you know, and people who talk about psionics, like they will always uh, talk about the interaction or, you know, maybe the, the discord or the, the tension between the Internet. And, you know, of course, you're, you're like 5G and stuff like that. You know, so it's something that is real in that sphere as well. So I, I don't necessarily think. Yeah, I definitely think that there is something to what you're saying, where the operational goals weren't meetable just in that domain and the internet developed to reach them. But there really is a lot of the time a crossover between those two areas no, of inquiry, well, you know, and, like- And Neuralink is the ultimate example, I guess, of that. Yeah, and- You yeah, know, and, maybe and, that's the dream. Well, yeah, <laughs> UFO is actually a great example because the two themes that you see, like, yeah, like, like Alex mentioned, the two themes are the MK Ultra sort of mental phenomena connection and the other one is metals and, and geomagnetics or whatever, mm. you know, like the mystery metals, like those are the two mm. things that always come up and are the, the, the perennial obsessions of this up to today with it to the star stuff of like the we have these compounds, you know, that will be of great use, you know, or whatever, mm -hmm. like uh, in our partnership. Free energy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they exactly. sold it to the army or something. This, yeah, exactly. Uh, they made like a partnership. Metal. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, what? Like, what are these metals? Like, tell me, you know, so <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. 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 Well, you guys, this has been great, and we just have to end it at some point, or we could go yeah, on forever. No, no, no. no it, it's the problem we always encounter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, it's uh, it's uh, yeah. it's to our benefit because mm -hmm. uh, subliminal jihad is something that everyone has to check out and experience for themselves. You guys have already kind of dropped a couple little hints about some stuff that's coming up, but maybe you want to do some more of that and tell people the best way to connect. 
Yeah. Sure. Well, yeah, you could find easiest way to find us is probably on Twitter at subliminal jihad. And you can find us individually that way too. Uh, you can find us on SoundCloud or Spotify or Apple podcasts and on Patreon where, yeah, like we said, that KPFA episode will be out later this week. And, yeah, you know, we do what we do one public. And, yeah, 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 yeah. One topic, one, one premium. Yeah, we got we got dog man coming, you know, maybe some people are attentive to the dog man the dog man mystery <laughs> we have our own take on that uh, coming down kpfa it's good yeah mm -hmm. our changing images of man episode uh and yeah. opperman on our show if you want to oh yeah know, we have an yeah. opperman interview that should yeah. be out uh mm -hmm. in the next week or two that was really yeah. great and mm -hmm. yeah what well, we're probably gonna we might go back to the i think the gifted children kind of thing yeah i think we might we, we just had an episode on patreon a kind of q and on update where we talked a lot about this like Q researcher Dave Troy. And if you want a spicy little nugget to leave you with, because this, this stitches uh, everything together, he happened to mention that his father went to Columbia and was selected as a part of a um, gifted child program. No um, way. And his mentor, you know who his mentor was? Donald Barr. Former Attorney General oh, Richard oh, oh. Barr's father, who oh got Jeffrey gosh. Epstein his job yes. at the Dalton School. Yes. He was also a CIA agent who, according to Terry Reid, trafficked cocaine out of Mena, Arkansas. I didn't realize in the 80s. he got Jeffrey uh, Epstein his job. Yeah, no, he got uh, Jeffrey Epstein. Really so, okay, that's yes. the closest we've gotten so far to proving that maybe Donald Barr, Bill Barr's dad, was running, and he was, he was running a program for like gifted Columbia students in like physics and science and stuff like oh that. And that's gosh. where this dude, Dave Troy's dad, he said he was his mentor. You know, and so that I mean, he was a little older at that point, but the fact that he was the head of Dalton School, and then he personally brought in Jeffrey Epstein, a college dropout, to teach <laughs> these elite, maybe gifted kids, kind of seems like maybe maybe Jeffrey Epstein was a gifted child of Donald Barr, and yep. then you know we're we're right there, we're right there in the yep. thick of it, you know. So yeah. I'll leave it. We we'll probably circle around to that that kind of stuff pretty soon, but you know. It's a it's a crazy web, but yeah. Anyways, we can yeah. stop. Yeah, yeah. We got some good stuff coming up, and yeah. No, this has been really fun. Thanks for having us on. Oh, yeah. thank you, Khalid and Dimitri. Yeah. You guys have been fantastic, and we'll do it again sometime. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'd love to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks again to Dimitri and Khalid from Subliminal Jihad for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I would tee up from this interview is, what do you make of Colonel Michael Aquino? Be careful how you answer, because the rabbit hole on this one gets very deep, very quick. QAnon, spirituality, MK Ultra, the whole shebang. Let me know your thoughts. Always love to hear from you. Until next time, take care and bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>